how should we think of medicine as a profession on the one hand it's a career path like any other you learn a skill and people pay you for your expertise but on the other hand it's also thought of as a noble calling you help other people you sometimes give them the gift of life and sometimes you give them a better life in india doctors are mostly invisible to us except when we have no option but to notice them and they can be both villains and heroes to us on one hand we rail against doctors who over prescribe tests and medicine because that's the way their incentives go and patients be damned we are objects to them on the other hand we go to them with our deepest problems including our greatest anxiety the fear of death and i'm not being hyperbolic when i say that over the last year doctors and nurses and other medical personnel have been our greatest heroes lakhs of these frontline workers in india have gone beyond their call of duty functioning in a battleground with limited information driven not just by money but by empathy and the desperate desire to help they have risked their lives to save the lives of others when i think of those who let us down in this crisis and the politicians are on top of that list i begin to lose faith in humanity but then I look at the medical profession and I regain that faith. You see we will beat this pandemic and it won't just be a triumph of science and medicine when we do. It will also be a triumph of human beings expressing their humanity. Welcome to the seen and the unseen. Our weekly podcast on economics, politics and behavioral science. Please welcome your host, Amit Varma. Welcome to the scene in the unseen. My guest today is Lancelot Pinto, a doctor and a scholar who has come to public attention in the last few months for being a voice of reason in this fog of confusion. Lance has been clearing doubts and misconceptions since this pandemic began and has been especially eloquent in recent weeks on the dangers of overprescribing drugs to COVID patients. Many of the deaths in recent weeks have come because of a dysfunctional state and were otherwise avoidable but some have happened because of over medication of doctors going overboard with medicine that has adverse side effects Lance called this out early and I wouldn't be surprised if he saved lives not just in his work as a doctor but also in his interventions as a public intellectual Friends of mine have actually been patients of his in this time and praise him highly. I was delighted when he agreed to be a guest on the show. I wanted to explore a much wider canvas than just COVID though. I wanted to explore the practice of medicine. Why do doctors opt for this profession? What is a doctor's life really like away from the glamour of Robin Cook novels and ER and scrubs? What are the incentives that drive doctors, both as doctors and as human beings? how do they stay in touch with the cutting edge of medicine which may be so different from what they learned in their college textbooks beyond these general questions i also wanted to talk about some of lance's areas of specialization he runs smoking cessation clinics and talks about how medicine has now made it easy to quit smoking he talks about the importance of sleep and the unintuitive ways in which our body functions did you know that a throat muscle can cause erectile dysfunction This is the scene and the unseen right there. So we cover a lot of ground in this episode and only the last half an hour or so is actually about COVID-19. I love this conversation. I learned a lot from it, but before we get to it, let's take a quick commercial break. Do you want to read more? I've put in a lot of work in recent years in building a reading habit. This means that I read more books, but I also read more long-form articles and essays. There's a world of knowledge available through the internet, but the problem we all face is how do we navigate this knowledge? How do we know what to read? How do we put the right incentives in place? Well, I discovered one way. A couple of friends of mine run this awesome company called CTQ Compounds at ctqcompounds.com, which aims to help people up-level themselves by reading more. A few months ago, I signed up for one of their programs called the Daily Reader. Every day for six months, they sent me a long-form article to read. The subjects covered went from machine learning to mythology to mental models and marmalade. This helped me build a habit of reading. At the end of every day, I understood the world a little better than I did before. So, if you want to build your reading habit, head on over to CTQ Compounds and check out their Daily Reader. New batches start every month. They also have a great program called Future Stack, which helps you stay up to date with ideas, skills, and mental models that will help you stay relevant in the future. Future Stack batches start every Saturday. Also, check out their Social Capital Compound, which helps you master social media. What's more you get a discount of a whopping 2500 rupees 2500 if you use the discount code unseen so head on over to ctq compounds at ctqcompounds.com and use the code unseen 
up level yourself lance welcome to the scene and the unseen thank you thank you for having me am uh, you know i've been seeing a lot of you over the last few months and thankfully on uh, you know on television on youtube uh, talking about covid and uh, enlightening many of us um, uh, on what's happening with covid medicine and all that but even though we have mutual friends besides that i have realized that i know nothing about you so i am going to start with a little bit of an exploration behind you know this public face that we see so take me back to your uh, childhood where did you grow up what was it like before your journey in medicine began to begin with amit i don't think you've missed anything much in terms of my journey but i i grew up in mumbai i was born in mumbai grew up here born in bombay grew up in mumbai that's how i like to say it <laughs> i was born in the suburb of mumbai called uh, bhandup it's it's a small little suburb in the on the central line so if you're familiar with bombay the suburbs are looked down upon very often but that that's where i began I went to a school so called St Xavier School and my dad worked in administration at Crompton Greaves and pretty much held one job all his life you know so that's that was uh, that was who he was uh, my mother was a school teacher at the school that I studied in she was a primary school teacher and both of them were migrants from Mangalore so they so they moved after they got married my dad was here for a couple of years before that and you know I I remember my dad telling me stories about how he came to the city with nothing which is which is so true for a lot of migrants to Mumbai. He stayed with his brother who was already here for some time and that was uh, that was my childhood. So I I grew up in a family where both my parents worked. I think uh, there was a strong ethos on working hard. You know, I I remember my dad leaving home at 7 in the morning because he worked in South Bombay which is the other end of town and would would return by 7:30 or so in the evening. I think education was always very important there was a stress on education however I I never felt pressured there was never any pressure to perform or you know there was never any you will grow up and become a doctor or engineer or anything of that sort fortunately for me and and I really don't know I mean there may be a lot of subtle things that help in life which you don't realize fortunately for me I I think I liked studying I was happy going to school I in fact you know at the end of vacations I was looking forward for school beginning again and and uh, I was naturally drawn towards reading and studying and and fortunately did well somewhere along you know when you reach middle school to high school is when you start thinking about what you want to become and I think I always wanted to become a pilot for some time uh, again I guess it's it's a common thing for a lot of people to want to do adventurous things like that but I think at some point of time somewhere close to maybe my 7th grade or so uh, this this whole thing about taking up medicine became real maybe it was influenced by the fact that my dad had a bypass when i was in the 6th standard there was some interaction with the healthcare system maybe i looked up to some of those doctors in oh and there was a lot of reading of robin cook as well which i don't know whether that's a good thing or a bad thing because that's a very skewed presentation of medicine but it still looks glamorous it looks interesting and i think i was naturally drawn towards medicine at that point of time so somewhere around the 7th or 8th standard it was it was medicine and nothing else for me of course you know growing up in a middle class household in mumbai you do not think of too many different options as a career you think of medicine you think of engineering you think of a few other things and in hindsight maybe you know my my alternative life would also include the possibility of journalism the possibility of being an author the possibility of uh, exploring the humanities in some way because i think that's a big lacuna in medical education that we aren't exposed to humanities so 10th standard you know big year important year you have to do well i did reasonably okay i i went to a college called ruya which was uh, so that's that's another recurring theme in my life i always got into the second best college i think or second best of mostly everything and we'll talk about that so you know the number one college in mumbai was considered ruprail for the sciences but i didn't make the cut so i i went to ruya then 12th standard is another uh, you know you realize that it's from a pool of 10000 odd people about 100 seats are what's available in the public institutions where you want to be in terms of an mbbs education and again you know the king edward memorial hospital or kem is considered number one in mumbai i didn't so my percentage was 95 and i think kem stopped at 95 point something <laughs> so uh, i got into sion hospital and and sion hospital was was a very interesting experience in terms of you know there was a decent balance of of extra curricular activities as well as studies where uh, you know it it wasn't the typical nerds where everybody constantly had their heads buried in books we had this festival called ashwamed which was quite important every year so we got some exposure to you know debating to doing a lot of public speaking etc and 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 those were good years 
that's pretty much the early years if you ask me so you know what kind of strikes me was that growing up as an 80s kid i remember back in the day the traditional occupations that good middle class kids were supposed to go as you said was you do doctor and engineering and a little later on mba also became kind of fashionable and this of course is if you didn't sit for the civil services now i would imagine that by the 90s post liberalization all of this is kind of changing but uh, nevertheless i think in the second half of the 90s you decide to go in for an mbbs anyway and you pointed out that you had a natural interest in this so couple of things strike me one is that it takes an awfully long time to become a doctor you do your engineering course and you're an engineer but with a doctor it's just a years keep stretching on it almost seems like you know you're in your 30s before you can actually do anything and even then there is a survivorship bias where you hear of good doctors making a lot of money but it's not necessary that at the end of that journey you will be successful so when you made that final call i mean obviously you must have taken this into account so what was the thinking that went behind it and when you started did you find that the study of medicine was turning out to be different from what you expected or you knew going in what it was going to be i mean as you pointed out there's a robin cook uh, influence and all of that so tell me a bit about your decision making during this time what you expected uh, what did you enjoy about it so it's a very interesting question you asked there because uh, so one of my closest friends in in school was a guy who went on to do engineering and i would spend a lot of time at, at his house and it was a joint family they had doctors in their house as well and this constant theme that i was reminded of was you know you choose medicine you're just going to be studying you will never make money you will be studying till you're 30 35 you know baal jhar jayenge which you know unfortunately is true right now but you know baal jhar jayenge lekin tumhara you know you you'll still be studying and and you know obviously anecdotes of doctors and their kids giving exams together you know come to the fore you know look at him his second standard uh, son and he are both giving exams at the same time so you know those kinds of stories were constantly you were constantly reminded that you know you may not be making such a good choice you know one of the things that really is is very crystal clear in my head was this conversation i had with this guy whose wife worked for one of the hospitals in mumbai and i i don't rem- remember whether she was a doctor or what was the context but he said something like listen you know you will become a doctor maybe you know maybe you'll get into medicine but at the end of medicine do you know how difficult it is to get a post graduate seat you know you will struggle with a post graduate seat and everybody who doesn't get a post graduate seat of their choice ends up doing psm so psm is preventive and social medicine and this is when i'm in like 10 standard i don't even know what he's talking about right so he says you will do psm and all you will be telling people to do is wash their hands and the irony is that for the past year all i've been telling people to do is wash their hands right <laughs> it's it's somehow come back to full circle but uh, to answer your question i i guess there is a lot of naivety when you make a choice when you are exactly from the background that i am you know you are middle class so you don't have a strong safety net in that sense where you can assume that you will study indefinitely and 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 you know you will somehow be supported and and yet you make this leap of faith and i and i think that that decision is a difficult decision and and i think some of that is is totally naivety you know because you don't know really you've seen only the glamorous part of things you don't realize that for every doctor who's probably you know in your face looking glamorous looking good there are probably 10 doctors who are really struggling who are finding it difficult uh, because it's such a competitive field because you know everyone is pretty intelligent so i think that final leap of faith is very often made against all advice and it's made at a time when you really don't know what's on the other side so it's truly a leap of faith in that sense you know so uh, to answer your question i think you know as fatalistic as it may sound i've also believed that things which don't work out sometimes just don't work out for a reason so had i not got the requisite marks to make it into medicine maybe i would have just like taken it in my stride and done something else at that point of time but even today you know so somebody going through the system even today where the applicant pool is so high you have to compete so hard to get into the right kind of colleges to get get a good edu- education i think there's no simple answer you know so if somebody asks me today if somebody in my similar situation who's in 10th or 11th asks me today whether this is the right choice for me i will place the facts in front of the person but i will not tell them that it's a no brainer that you know this is this is the best life that you'll ever have because it is a tough life and you know i think that that's kind of my answer to your question yeah you know that's very illuminating because just thinking aloud uh, you know i had a young person um, come to me for advice a few months ago where his uh, mother wanted him to 
do medicine and he was like what's the scene and i said listen in the end of course it is a personal decision it's up to you but just putting my economics hat on i would say that the opportunity cost of medicine is far higher because if you decide engineering is not for you you can do an mba you can go to a scroll or a wire or a times of india and say make me a trainee reporter or whatever there are all those options are kind of there but medicine you could be 30 by the time you realize you're not going to make it and it could be too late so if if all things were equal set it as parables it would almost be a no brainer not to do medicine but if that's where your heart lies that's where your heart lies now my other question here is that i've spoken to people who say that we got into medicine because of a passion for biology because of the wonder of medicine like one of my friends told me that you know one of his parents died of cancer when he was young and he said i want to find the cure for cancer right and therefore he gets into medicine but having gotten a certain way along the academic path he realized that wait a minute doctors don't find the cure for anything i need to be a scientist and then he goes and he becomes a scientist and now he's a successful academic somewhere so you know did you go through that kind of process because a lot of the things that i guess would attract you which would be intellectually attractive or stimulating about the study of medicine would actually be related to science and higher research rather than becoming a practicing doctor to begin with and i'm aware that you have an msc in epidemiology and all of that which you went on to do but you are a practicing doctor so obviously this has to be something that you then thought about and what then made you decide that no i will practice i will be a doctor because it seems to me that just from the way that i uh, look at it it feels that in science you are always moving forward even if it's a little forward incrementally but you're moving forward while in medicine it seems that you're running to stand still you're always trying to kind of figure out what is the latest and kind of apply that so h- how has that process of thinking these things through been for you so i think when when people begin no matter what they begin in terms of their career i think everybody has a very big canvas in mind they always think that you know they're going to change the world in some way so if you you know if you met someone like if you met me when i was say in my 10th grade or my 12th grade and and said you know what is evidence based medicine do you know how how will you make decisions when it comes to patient care i think there was no concept of of anything like that at that point of time in the sense in on my radar right so most most of the decisions are made in terms of what kind of a person do you want to be so i i was i was always attracted to this concept of just working hard and giving it your best no matter what and you know let things take care of themselves you know don't don't be obsessed about uh, how much money you're making don't be obsessed about what what is the so called return on investment you know which is which is the whole argument against medicine right which which everyone reminds you again and again that you know when are you going to make money and the the worst is when you're like around 24 years old you know where all your friends the last bencher in your school is also suddenly joined the merchant navy and he's making like 20 times the amount that you are and and everybody points out that you've you've clearly made the wrong decision so i i think this this decision comes from a place of i think a larger principle that you know you enjoy in at some level helping people i don't necessarily mean in an altruistic way or i don't mean it i don't mean it in a in a charitable way i i mean it in a way that you know somebody comes to you with some sort of a problem you are able to give them some sort of an instant relief you are able to give them solace in some way and that turnaround time is rapid enough that you get the feedback you feel good about it you feel that that you are making a difference on micro levels and I, and i think that's the model or that's the goal that people are attracted to at that stage when you know early on now whether that will cause a big dent in the world possibly not you know but i think those little joys on a day to day basis where even though you know as you rightly pointed out you're running to stay in the same place when you look at the macro picture but at the micro picture you you're making small moves every single day which uh, which give you a lot of instant gratification which a lot of other fields possibly don't get you know if you're a, I'm, and this is my perspective and i could be completely wrong but say if you're a software engineer and you're designing software maybe when the product is finally ready one year down the road you get a lot of gratification and you get a lot of sense of achievement but during that one year it's probably every single day is is um, is tough you know because you're just writing code maybe but but for a doctor i think there are a lot of small joys in every single day and i i, I think that's what drives a lot of us especially in your early years because you've seen you've yourself gone to a doctor at some point of time you've yourself realized that they give you some sort of a salve some sort of a relief at that point which makes you feel good and i think i think that process is something which is very attractive 
That's really interesting because I mean, when you think about it, the world is a positive some place, and we benefit when others benefit uh, mostly, unless you know you're in the government or you're rent seeking or whatever. But for most of us, the benefit that comes from our work is unseen. It's, it's like really the seen and the unseen. That it's way down the road, like you said, if a software engineer designs some software, even when the software is out there, he can't really see the benefit. He doesn't know how much difference his few lines of code made. Maybe if he works in Microsoft, maybe that's what made Windows hang. But in your case, it's a little. more immediate which is um, fascinating to me it also sort of strikes me that you know when we think of experts when we think of the professionals we think of them as people who know their field but i think what often happens is in many fields whether it is medicine or economics or whatever in all fields there's a set of people who are not really actively engaged in that sense they are doing the degree they get the knowledge and that is the knowledge they have and very often it's kind of a static kind of knowledge and they don't have the intellectual curiosity to maybe apply their frame to other things and constantly broaden constantly read all of that and uh, you know i notice this most with some economists you know there are really two kinds of economists those who are thinking actively about the world and those who have done the training who can make the charts and do the regressions and all that but aren't really thinking that actively now with doctors also it seems to me that we think of doctors as experts we have a problem we go to a doc doc will solve it but very often you know a doctor say trained in the 1990s was trained in what was in many fields very outdated knowledge for example nutrition right where for the longest time for decades uh, you know the sugar lobby funded all these studies at harvard and all that in the 1950s and 60s and uh, you know fat was demonized sugar was supposed to be okay and the american government released guidelines to this effect in the late 1970s and their obesity epidemic begins from there and in something like the last 10 to 15 years it's kind of become common knowledge that all of this is kind of uh, rubbish we've been obsessing over the wrong things sugar is the real problem now one of my friends went to a doctor recently to ask about nutrition and he got that old dogma because she hadn't read up and updated herself on the state of the science so a two part question really that when you were studying did you notice this difference in approach that there are people who just want to understand what is in the books and do well in the exams and there are people who are naturally curious who are reading more and therefore who are more likely in future to stay updated with whatever the state of the science is i think part of that is the problem in which medical education occurs and you know it's it's very fact heavy so let's look at medical textbooks right so i mean most of us have this god textbook for every subject under the sun so if you're studying anatomy this is the god textbook if you're studying physiology this is the god textbook now i've been part of a process of knowing how textbooks are written and if you look at how textbooks are written uh, the time gap between when the decision to write the textbook begins to the textbook actually being published is usually around 2 to 3 years so when it actually gets published some of the stuff was current and relevant 3 years ago and is probably already been surpassed by newer knowledge or superseded by a newer study which has happened so if you bank completely on textbooks you're not going to get state of the art knowledge however medical education gives a lot of focus on textbooks so that's that's one example where you are taught keep sticking to the facts which are written in the textbook that's written in stone because it's this god textbook it's this is this bible of of a particular subject you are not taught the methodology to critique things you are taught remember the facts you are not really trained in how to critique facts so if that training comes into play then you would have this healthy discussion which would constantly happen which happens in academia right where somebody says something and another person points out and says but listen there was this newer study which was published just two days ago have you gone through it and that that constant debate that constant being the, the constant chatter among academics which makes one realize that you know you need to constantly update yourself is very often lacking in medical schools that is a big problem so that you are not taught really to question now whether that divides the world into two parts i i don't think it's that straightforward i think most of us with a medical education come out again with these same concepts of truths being absolutely written in stone it's when you start practicing if if you are curious enough if you realize that you know every patient does not fit into a particular mold if you start questioning why something's happening in a certain way when you expected it to happen the other way if you then get into a process of constantly searching constantly reviewing the literature i think that that makes a lot of difference now part of that is also a function of time so it is extremely difficult 
for doctors to continuously update themselves, which is why it would be nice if there were simpler guidelines, right? I mean, that's what we all want. We want some sort of a guideline that's constantly updated or some sort of a course which we can attend once a year where we get updated and change our practice. Now, expecting a practicing doctor to be able to continuously update themselves is, is a tough task. And the way it works, unfortunately or unfortunately in medicine, is that the, the older you get, the more senior you get, your patient base increases. And, you know, there's word of mouth, there's a general uh, awareness of a particular doctor, of a particular specialty being there. And that just means that you're getting busier and busier and therefore having lesser and lesser time to update yourself. And unfortunately, this then becomes a common trajectory for a lot of doctors. And, you know, even I hope this doesn't happen to me, but that's the natural drift, unfortunately that you get busy, you get popular, you get more patients, less time to read, and gradually you start doing things which are outdated. And I think this needs to be rethought. You know, we need to figure out a way to get out of this. And how does one keep in touch with latest research then? Like, is the internet a game changer there? Because I would assume that pre the internet for a practicing doctor to want to keep in touch with the latest in the field, especially if you're in India and all the latest research and all that is happening in the US is incredibly difficult. But now it should be kind of easier. So what, what, what are your practices? Like, are there journals you go to? Do you spend a certain amount of time reading papers? Do you tell yourself that X percent of the time I must devote to updating uh, myself or, uh, you know, leveling up. How does that process kind of work for you? So I think one of the best ways of keeping yourself updated on the literature is having students, right? And I, I have the luxury of having students. I'm at a teaching institute. So when you teach students, you automatically update yourself on the latest literature. If you inculcate that hunger in them, students have this natural questioning hunger, which they will, you know, they will pose questions to you on rounds sometimes saying that, you know, is this the right way of doing things? And that again needs to be fostered. If you go by the didactic method that it's my way or the highway, you know, this is right because boss says so, you will, you will end up having your knowledge not updated because, you know, where you are at is where you will be. Your students will not question you and you will keep perpetuating the same cycle. If you have students who constantly ask you or, and you can ask them as well, you know, why don't you read up on this and tell me more about this? That exchange keeps you updated and it's very useful. But then again, I have the luxury of, of, of being in a teaching institute. If you're not at a teaching institute, fortunately, there are a lot of, I don't know what they're called. They're probably like meta websites, which uh, have started compiling literature from all the available evidence. And, you know, the thing that comes to mind, which I use on a day-to-day -day basis is something called UpToDate. So UpToDate is a website, which also has an app on your phone now where they get experts in a particular field to write a particular topic. And that expert will cover the topic through and through. The experts are also incentivized to update it every year or so. I think, you know, they're, they're actually paid. I, I know because some of my supervisors have written topics here and they are incentivized to keep updating the topic. So, so supposing I have this patient sitting in front of me who I think has this rare lung disorder. And I've, you know, the last time I've seen a patient with something like this was about three years back. So clearly I'm not going to be by default updated on the literature because it's not been on my radar. I haven't actively searched for this disease. So I go to up to date, I open it and very often, you know, I will, I will come to know if there's a new drug available, if there's a new therapy that has been tried somewhere. There are links sometimes which will take me to earlier studies and then I can choose to go into a deep dive. So up to date will summarize what the literature is, give me the references for those papers. I can then go and dig out those papers myself, critique those papers, see if they make sense and summarize. But this is not as easy as it sounds in the sense that you're trying to do all of this in the middle of an OPD, in the middle of a clinic. So I have sometimes told patients, let me read up. I open this in front of the patient and I do it. But I can see how a lot of people would feel that doing that would make the patient question their credentials. So I think we need to also create a healthy atmosphere where, you know, the doctor doesn't know all the answers. The doctor will can, you know update his knowledge if necessary in front of you. The doctor is someone who will give you the best knowledge as of today. How he gets there could be a journey, could be, you know, could could involve some time on your part. He doesn't need to be an encyclopedia with all the answers ready. You know, as long as we start moving to that modality where even patients accept that, you know, accept a doctor who's searching in front of them, accept a doctor who says, I don't know. I think that's great. So when I, when I talk to my friends and relatives, I, I tell them very often that the doctor you want is the doctor who once in a while, you know, says, I don't know the answer to this question. Right. If you have a doctor who knows the answer to every question, then that's that's, you know, I mean, if it could be exceptionally good, of course, but, you know, that would be a rarity. 
you know this leads me into a digression on what patients really expect from their doctors and i think in india at least they expect a veneer of knowledge they expect their doctor to be like an expert to have the definitive answers to give them medicines like you know as you have also pointed out in the past this is what leads to over prescription and all of that i remember i read an episode on healthcare with the economist karthik murli tharan and he referred to this uh, a study in uh, 2007 where uh, you know the, the author of the study asked a doctor in a slum so that you know when someone has diarrhea what do you give them and the person listed out a bunch of medicines and then the guy asked that you know why don't you just give them oral rehydration because that's enough that's what WHO recommends and he said no because then they won't come to me they've come to a doctor they expect a bunch of medicines that's what i do if i don't do that they'll go to someone else i lose income and and that's something by the way in india that it's not just doctors it's we expect all our experts to be full of certainty while the truth is that those who know the most will have the least certainty because they'll know how much they don't know whereas you know it's a dunning kruger effect that uh, it's uh, often the fools who have the greatest certainty not to say that doctors are necessarily like that so what do you feel about this that do you feel that there is also this kind of interaction where you not only have to find the best treatment but you also have to live up to the patient's expectations so is it like a game theoretic problem somewhere where there are trade offs you have to consider absolutely i couldn't agree more so you gave a context in which you have a diagnosis i often have to face a situation where i tell the patient listen we need to do a few tests you know we'll we'll do these tests we'll you know meet up again with the results of these tests and and then we'll talk about what needs to be done and on their way out they very often will turn back and say but what have you given me in treatment today and i need to tell them that i don't know what you have you know i genuinely don't know what you have how can i treat you if i don't know what you have and they still will very often insist that you know but just give me something for today you know it it's it's almost like this whole interaction is incomplete till there is a prescription prescribing drugs you know it's not just a prescription with with this it has to be a prescription prescribing drugs because i have come to you with a problem and you have to give me a fix in some way so i i completely empathize you know so i'm there is no judgment on my part when i see doctors you know starting off people on a bunch of medications or doctors being forced to order tests sometimes because we we've, we've created this sort the sort of a culture where you know a doctor who prescribes lot and i get better is the right doctor the doctor who says take nothing even if i get better but he didn't give me anything so it's not it's vasool nahi hua as you say in hindi you know there was it 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 didn't complete the interaction what did i pay him so much for you know why did i waste my time going there i didn't get anything out of it so i i think this is a this is a genuine problem and i think we need to start thinking in terms of how to let people know that medicines are not a solution for every problem and going on and on indefinitely with medicines are also not a solution you know and there are there are some problems which can be fixed there are some problems to which you know there are no solutions sometimes you just have to have to accept that i mean we we talk about all these fancy things and you know cutting edge stuff and doing scans while as you look at respiratory medicine something as simple as cough you know there are there are people who are doing phd's in cough as of today you know after after you know centuries and centuries of coughing we still don't know what really causes cough in certain certain circumstances we still don't know where the receptors exactly might be we still don't know what is the drug that will actually work i remember meeting this world expert in cough and he runs a cough clinic and i said you know how do you there was a particular example i gave him and i said how do you treat it so he says listen my my clinic's very busy so i cannot uh, you know see people frequently so i can see them maybe once a month so i i take any four random drugs which work on cough generally i say if week 1 you try this if this doesn't work week 2 you try this if that doesn't work week 3 you try this if that doesn't work week 4 you try this and he says for all you know nature cures them at some point of time and then the patient attributes the cure to that last medication you know so that's how it is you know people want some sort of a medicine as a solution for every problem and and i think we need to do something to to counter that no in fact uh, you know what you said uh, reminded me of the common phenomenon of regression to the mean right like why do for example people think homeopathy works part of it is of course a placebo effect but part of it is if you take homeopathy for something that's going to get better anyway you will ascribe causation you will say oh this cured me and this could also be true of any cocktail of medicines that the doctor gives you for a particular point where you got better on your own but hey you feel this worked and uh, you know you'll give credit to the medicine and therefore to the doctor and this of course happens in politics also where you know amitya 
recently came out and said that you know Narendra Modi ji has solved the second wave and I'm like that's regression to the mean right the second wave at some point in time would have gone down in the most extreme case with everyone dying but whatever happens a wave would have gone down so the fact of it going down alone is not reason enough to take uh, uh, credit but I don't want to draw you into that kind of political stuff what am I even doing a couple of interesting things like one thing that sort of strikes me is that when it comes to the practice of medicine itself especially i'm assuming in a place like india i think two things would happen for a doctor and i'm just sort of thinking aloud and you can enlighten me on whether these processes actually happen and all of that one is because you're seeing a multiple number of patients and you do not have unlimited time for each one you develop these what economists call fast and frugal heuristics by which you figure out that okay this is the symptom and this is likely to be the most common cause for it and therefore let me try this and all of that and how does that process work because initially as a young person you must be enthusiastic you want to get to the root of everything is there a point in time when you realize that in practical terms it is not possible and i'll let you answer this first and then i'll go on to my next one so that's again the unfortunate part of medicine you know the 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 better you get the more successful you get the larger the volume of patients you have the larger the volume of patients you have the lesser time you spend with each one of them and then you know exactly what you said you are pretty much triaging in your head is this person in dire need for some emergent treatment or is this person not so bad where you know we can just quickly give him something send him off you know maybe nature takes care of it maybe he gets better and he comes back if it doesn't then he comes back to me and maybe that second time round is where i really spend more time because now i realize that you know that quick 3 minute consult wasn't wasn't good enough i completely agree with you you know the unfortunate part of becoming successful and being good at something in medicine especially is that eventually it leads to large volumes and and i think one of the ways in which you can solve this problem is by having a team so if you have a good second rung if you have a good bunch of assistants working with you kind of filter things out you know give you a brief quick summary of what's happening and then you act on that summary i think i think that makes a big difference uh, because otherwise it you know exactly what you said it becomes like quick algorithms everything becomes algorithmic and whoever doesn't fit into that algorithm is a problem so let me give you an example you know since we're talking about covid 19 uh, so one of the things that has been a common problem over the past year is individuals who come to me with breathlessness who are actually sighing you know because of anxiety you take a deep breath and you breathe out and that you know na- there are natural processes which lower your heart rate when you do that there are natural processes which calm you when you do that so it's almost like an epidemic of sighing that i have seen over the past year and these individuals if you go down that same algorithmic route somebody says they are breathless you, you know do a whole bunch of tests you know you te- and then find nothing wrong then you try some inhaler you try something i mean you can completely go down that route but very often if you just spend like 30 seconds looking at that person and talking to that person you will realize that during that conversation itself the person sighs a couple of times and you realize that the person is in a hospital the person is anxious and clearly that person is saying you ask them when they sleep at night do they sigh or get up breathless and the answer to that is almost always no so clearly you know whatever the problem is is not happening at night which again points towards a, a psychological problem something something that's making the person anxious and again if you know this is this is why it's important to spend time this is why it's important to observe patients and realize what's happening this is mind blowing an epidemic of sighing wow another question My last episode was with Kavita Krishnan and in that we briefly spoke about Mary Wollstonecraft the great feminist author of uh, the early 19th century or the late 18th century really and uh, one of the tragedies there is that she died young because she died during childbirth in fact she gave birth to uh, Mary Shelley who would later marry the poet and uh, and she died 3 days after childbirth i think because the doctor didn't wash his hands right because that basic protocol was not known at the time that is something that happened in the middle of the 19th century Ignal Semmelweis said that you know correlated not washing hands to disease and people ignored him for decades and i think if i remember correctly he died in a lunatic asylum eventually something really sad like that and that eventually got figured out but that that was also the reason that around that time things like homeopathy and all that alternative medicines became common because at least they weren't harming people i mean of course there is harm in terms of the opportunity cost you don't get some other treatment if you take sugar pills but they weren't harming people whereas if you went to a hospital your chances of dying were insanely high because evidence based medicine as it were was simply not at that stage of advancement now that of course has changed and today it is but for most things how important would you say 
these processes still are internalizing them and with the washing of hands being the most basic example but if you think of do no harm just kind of internalizing them and going with the, i mean there's a great quote i forget by whom some famous doctor you might know i just read this recently on uh, twitter i think anirban mahapatra quoted uh, this person in his episode with me on covid-19 where he said that at its core every medicine is a poison so to what extent does the do no harm imperative of the physician go in both in terms of processes or best practices like washing hands and all of that and also just being aware that listen i'm expected to give a cocktail of medicines to this person but all of them have side effects all of them can do harm in different ways like we are finding out and we'll discuss covid-19 later but if you give steroids too early that depresses the immune system and chances are your fever will go down but covid will hit you really hard after that happens which has happened in so many cases so how much of a part is just being aware of what not to do as much as what to do i think it's extremely important uh, to not trivialize any medicine you know for some reason we have this concept of safe medicines and unsafe medicines and what you said was absolutely right it's the it's the dose that determines what a poison is you know i think there's a latin quote which says that you know things like vitamin d for example you can overdose on vitamin d when given as an injection and we've seen patients get admitted with hypervitaminosis d which is a real thing you know it causes confusion it causes it causes a lot of problems so even things which are seemingly innocuous uh may not necessarily be innocuous may not be innocuous for a particular person right it may be okay for 99 so that's another aspect number one it may not be innocuous for anyone number two maybe what what if there is a subset of people in whom it doesn't react well and we just prescribe it assuming that you know these words which are used you know safe vitamins immunity boosters you know things that give a person a sense of uh, something is being done and because by virtue of something being done i am going to be in a better place than i was uh, prior to receiving this and yes there is a placebo effect you know people do feel better with a lot of different things and that is a challenge for a doctor as well you know in terms of should i give something because that something will act like a placebo and make this person feel better and therefore you know my obligation to be a caregiver of some sort should not supersede my obligation to just be absolutely right and proper about not unnecessarily prescribing things so that's the balance that you have to find so if if somebody comes to me and somebody comes to another doctor we're talking about a counterfactual where the other doctor gives the patient a vitamin the patient suddenly feels a boost of energy he, he or she is happy they go back feeling extremely satisfied versus the patient coming to me i say you know you have nothing wrong with you please go away in the nicest way possible of course but you know that person continues to suffer in some way who's to say who's right in this circumstance right this is where the challenge lies you know the the effect of placebos should it really mean something to a doctor as well to give a placebo but based on the fact that we are scientists and based on the fact that we hold on to science uh, for everything that we do i think we shouldn't be doing anything without a strong rational reason or scientific basis that suggests that something is going to work and you know i'm equally passionate making this argument with tests i mean possibly even more than medicines right for me if i order a test the outcome of the test must influence my treatment decisions in some way you know if you look at probability probabilistically there was a study done which shows that if you did eight random tests without a pretest probability right so not bayesian you just randomly just gave anybody eight tests 20% of the population that you give those eight tests to would have one abnormal value completely by random chance right no wow. now if you increase that to 16 tests i think it's about 16 or 20 tests that probability goes up to about 99% so one test will be abnormal completely by random chance so if you ask for a test you need to know that if the abnormal value comes back are you going to do something about it and if the answer to that is i'm not going to do anything about it you have no business ordering that test to begin with i think the same flavor holds true for medicines as well you do not want to give medicines just because you can't leave a prescription blank or you don't know what needs to be done uh you give a medicine only when you believe that science has proven in some way that taking that medicine for that individual will improve his or her odds of getting better as compared to doing nothing i i think that should be the guiding light 
And earlier we spoke about doctors responding to incentives from patients in terms of overprescribing and all that. But doctors are also prey to other kinds of incentives. And I'm told this is more of a problem in the north than here. But I'd like your opinion on it, which is that look, you're working for a hospital in different places. From what I've heard, doctors will get a commission for every test that they order, so they incentivize to order tests. The they get a revenue share in uh, whatever their practice brings in within the hospital. So they are incentivized towards asking the patient to do. maximum tests which may be unnecessary with you know all kinds of over treatment and I, i know that just talking about these incentives makes doctors seem like heartless mercenary beings and uh, i don't want to give that impression at all especially because what i think has become visible to all of us in the last few months is that our frontline workers in the healthcare systems are doctors and nurses and other medical personnel are our heroes they are like the firefighters of 911 how do you respond to these incentives then do these incentives exist how does someone like you then draw a line and say that no i am not going to uh, do this uh, which would immediately hurt your income how does one negotiate that so i'm honestly fortunate to be in an ecosystem which does not demand any of that to me so i'm that that makes me very com- comfortable in terms of what i'm doing i mean my hospital is an ethical hospital we there is no pressure of i can admit somebody not give them anything and discharge them after 5 days and there will be no questions asked that being said i i have heard very often of these incentives being in place but you know what what i think amit i don't think any doctor begins with a place that they would want to do that i think every doctor possibly starts with a place that listen i will do what is indicated i will do what's completely ethical and if as part of doing something ethical i i get some sort of a bonus or some sort of kickback what's so wrong in that i i think that's the starting point for people who indulge in that the problem is it starts off like that but this is a line which is very difficult to walk on right i mean like any other incentive in life at what point does the incentive drive the prescription versus the incentive being incidental to the prescription is, is where the huge challenge lies and and this is true for anyone so i mean you know i i've worked with somebody called dick menzies at mcgill who would refuse to take a pen from a pharmaceutical company he would say that the moment i have a pen from a pharmaceutical company i will be obliged to do something nice in return to this person you know i have received pens from pharmaceutical companies and i have never thought of it because i believe genuinely that uh, you know this is just a pen this is not going to influence my practice but to be honest who knows at a subconscious level if that particular pen writes really well maybe or that particular pen is is something that i'm very fond of uh, maybe at a subconscious level i will be more inclined to support that particular company which gave me that pen you know so i think i think these are these are inherent to the practice I think the extreme version of it would be to completely not accept anything but you know I think majority of us uh get into a zone where we con- we honestly believe that you know a little bit here and a little bit there in terms of a, you know a gift for Diwali for example is not going to make so much of a difference but but that's a very tough that's a very thin line you know and and I think that's a challenge uh, that that most doctors face Is there a systemic issue here then is there a systemic issue that look if you want to set up a hospital you want to maximize your revenue because it's it's obviously expensive to do so and this is one way of doing that that you incentivize the doctors and then it just becomes a vicious cycle and you've pointed out that your hospital Hinduja Hospital doesn't do this it's a quote unquote ethical hospital so uh, my, my question then is that is it possible for new hospitals to come up that are ethical hospitals or are they putting themselves at a competitive disadvantage with hospitals that or uh, unethical hospitals as it were though i'm sure they wouldn't describe themselves that way i can imagine that uh, if healthcare is treated like the open market i can imagine how not indulging in such practices would hit your bottom line i mean that's that's straightforward math so i can imagine the fact that it's uh, relatively difficult to compete and uh, match up to maybe the incomes of other individuals in other hospitals if you don't play the game by the rules that have been established uh so so i can see how that could be a problem and i think that problem arises uh, when you start dealing with healthcare as uh, you would deal with anything else in the free market and that's that's the reason that's the whole the whole conversation around medical ethics the whole conversation around why patients need to be protected etc comes from this whole asymmetry of knowledge between doctors and the persons deriving the services you cannot treat it as a, in the, in the same way as you would treat any other open market which is why all over the world there are safeguards in place to prevent things from happening 
I think that's the bottom line. You know, it, there needs to be something in place to prevent it from being a completely open market. There has to be some sort of regulation. For example, the same for pharmaceutical companies, if you take an example, are completely not allowed to do a lot of the things in stricter countries that they are allowed to do in, in, in a country like India. And why has that happened? Because of the same reason, the government has realized at some point of time that if you let it open, if you let it work or function like a free market, it's going to be demand supply, it's going to be the same kind of incentivize, it's going to be not necessarily in the consumer's best interest, it's going to be the in the best interest of the players, you know, uh, and that's why it needs to be regularized. I would imagine that, you know, the solution can also come from within the free market. For example, if you had enough supply, if you had enough, uh, if you had ease of entry and uh, enough hospitals and all that, then some of them would advertise that we are ethical hospitals in these ways that, you know, no commissions are given to doctors on ordering tests or blah, blah, blah. And then that would also, you know, it would become a competitive advantage instead of something that you do out of pure idealism. So that is also possible. But anyway, that's that's a whole different question let's kind of get back i mean i have a bunch of other general questions i'll also come to before we come to covid but i want to now go back earlier in your, um, your personal journey which we left when we took all these digressions that you know you're doing medicine and you're doing your mbbs and all of that what does the journey from there look like like how do you choose what to specialize in uh, you've specialized in uh, respiratory diseases and so on. You've also spoken a lot on tuberculosis. I also want to talk to you about sleep because, uh, you know, I watched a presentation of yours on that on YouTube and uh, it was extremely en enlightening in many TIL moments. But before that, tell me a bit about your journey, that how do you get interested in these things as opposed to other things? And then what prompts that next sort of step where it's not just that you've become a doctor, but you're actually going and doing an MSc in McGill University as you did Tell me how you're evolving during these years. In terms of uh, the choice of specialization, I think very early on, for most of us, if you speak to most doctors, very early on, somewhere in the at the end of the first or the second year, people kind of figure out whether they want to become surgeons or they want to become physicians. So I think that's, and it's it's quite fascinating actually, you know, in terms of personalities, in terms of, you know, what kind of individuals are drawn towards surgery, what kinds of individuals are drawn towards medicine. I'm sure it'll make an interesting study someday to you know do personality tests and figure out who's drawn to what. Even in terms of subjects, in the first year, we have something called anatomy, physiology and biochemistry. And very often the guys who love physiology end up drifting towards being a physician. The guys who are hardcore into anatomy end up drifting towards surgery. And that kind of plays out further down the course as well. So I think uh, very early on, physiology is something that fascinated me. And it still does, you know, just, just understanding mechanisms is, is mind blowing sometimes why something occurs. And I think if you really understand physiology, you, you you really understand a lot of medicine. You don't you don't need you know superlative knowledge in terms of medications and drugs as long as you understand the basics of why what happens. Uh, so I loved physiology. I had a distinction in physiology. It was one of my favorite subjects, and I think that pretty much decided that I was going to be a physician. I I also am a lazy guy, so standing in one place for like six hours was uh, was not for me so that so that got decided early on now at the end of your mbbs it's the same fight again right a whole big pool of really smart people all of them trying to get into coveted fields i think a, a decent chunk of us end up in fields that we get rather than the fields that we initially want the good thing about medicine though is that if you really like questioning things if you really get excited about the body and you know small processes here and there really no matter what you decide to become and and what, where you end up being where you end up being can be equally fascinating equally interesting because if you take a deep dive into any particular field i i think it can be fascinating so in my last year i mean i was i fully knew that i was going to become a physician but i had this gynecology professor who was really really passionate about teaching and i was completely in love with the subject in terms of, you know, I eventually got a distinction in the subject. I would read, I would, you know, attend labor, uh, you know, watch things happen, be, be, be really passionate about gynecology, fully knowing fully well that this was not what I was going to become. And I think that's the passion that a good teacher, you know, instills in you that teaches you things about uh, a field that you may not even be interested in pursuing but you realize it's fascinating. So again, to come back to the question, I initially wanted to do internal medicine. That was a broader, you know, head to toe, get an idea of 
physiology, how everything works in terms of the body systems, and then, you know, possibly super specialize in something else eventually. But again, you know, I mean, as, as usual, I didn't get into the first field of choice. I, I got into respiratory medicine purely by chance. So I was doing a presentation. I was working at Hinduja as uh, it was a job that I was doing post MBBS. I was doing a, a presentation and uh, Dr. Udvadia, who was um, the, the chest physician at Hinduja, walked in and listened to the presentation. At the end of it, he came up to me and he said, you know, that was a great presentation, etc. And I interviewed for medicine. I didn't make it into medicine. And then the respiratory interviews were happening and I interviewed and and it just worked out. It just worked out because he remembered me from this random presentation. You know, So it was just, uh, it was good fortune. That being said, you know, I mean, respiratory medicine is very hardcore to physiology. It's very hardcore to internal medicine. It's it's very central to other body systems as well. So I, I completely enjoyed my residency. So my residency was uh, at Hinduja. And again, there is a general perception of public institutes being much better than private institutes. And, you know, so again, my first choice would have been a public institute had everything aligned the way it, it should have. But it didn't. I, I got into a private institute. But I must say, I mean, the kind of education that I got here for three years was was really defining in a lot of different ways. You know, we had Dr. Advadia and Dr. Mahashur, both of them senior, both of them very good. Dr. Mahashur, who was the head of department of KEM. So he came from a public institute. He, he had served most of his life in a public institute. And Dr. Udvadia, who, who was at the frontier of research, he was somebody who was very passionate about research. We did this study in 2010. Uh, we basically took 106 different practitioners were practicing in a slum of Mumbai. This was Dharavi. And we asked them to fill up a prescription for a person with a standard weight. So I think we said the weight was 60 kilos. A person with 60 kilos came and sat in front of you and he has tuberculosis, write up a prescription. That was our, that was kind of what we requested them to do. And 106 practitioners, if I remember right, wrote 64 different prescriptions, out of which six were what we considered to be accurate and right based on the current guidelines then. So six of 106 were accurate. So that was an eye opener as well, you know, and that was when we realized it, it, it also opened my eyes in terms of tuberculosis and realizing that about 70 percent of the population, 70 to 80 percent of the population approached the private healthcare system first when they wanted treatment for tuberculosis. And most of our data, most of our information, most of our guidelines, everything was directed towards the public health care system. So it was this mismatch where everybody, you know, thinks about the private health care system as being driven by incentives, not being kosher in a lot of different ways. And yet, number one, you know, it seemed like patients were preferring us. And, and number two, there was this chaos in terms of prescriptions, in terms of the way medicine was practiced. So that was a big eye opener in terms of research. You know, that was that was the first major publication that that I had. And, you know, it got me passionate about TB. The other side, of course, was Dr. Mahashur, who taught me some really great things in terms of how to take care of patients. So Dr. Mahashur would insist, you know, we would go on rounds and, uh, you know, I would start saying 31 oh, year old patient who's this, 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 this. And you would suddenly stop you and say, what's the name of the patient? And then all of a sudden you realize that, you know, you were caught on the back foot. You didn't know the name of the patient because, you know, everything was just details right you're taught to be detail oriented and and he was very insistent that we knew every patient by name we knew a little more about them in terms of their background we knew what their social circumstances were and i think that was fantastic that that was an eye opener i remember a situation where we had this elderly lady who was admitted forever you know one of those patients was not getting discharged and dr marshall would come on rounds and we would pretty much not do anything so you know as residents you want to have as less work as possible or you want to be streamlined and we would constantly wonder you know why is this lady there we're not doing anything for her and then one fine day he he told us about the story about how she had problems at home and how she wasn't accepted at home and how she didn't have a caregiver at home and the moment she went home she would deteriorate things wouldn't work out for her because there was nobody to take care of her and he pretty much knew everything about the family you know which we, despite the fact that we spent every single day with her, hadn't bothered asking her about at all. So I, I think this balance was great. You know, the balance of, of cutting edge, you know, trying to uh, identify the big questions in research, trying to really work on changing the world in some ways, while at the same time being completely grounded to the reality that at the end of the day, you know, we are caregivers. At the end of the day, you can be all evidence-based medicine if you want, but if you don't uh, provide comfort to patients in some way, you're not necessarily a good doctor. So I, I, I think that made a big difference in, in terms of my training at, as far as respiratory medicine goes. Yeah, so, uh, you know, in my episode with uh, Karthik on healthcare, we'd uh, kind of 
discussed a bunch of studies and what they all showed is pretty much what you are pointing out about only six doctors out of 100 and whatever kind of getting it right and and that was true in his studies for both public and uh, private in fact public fared a bit worse but my question before we move on is why did the guys who got it wrong get it wrong that's a difficult question honestly so uh, i think part of that is the fact that people just don't bother updating themselves sometimes so maybe they weren't up to speed in terms of what the data uh, was telling them what the guidelines were telling them maybe nobody reached them in a way because they were practicing in a in a place where uh, you know the dissemination of knowledge wasn't a priority it was also a disease like tuberculosis where drugs don't tend to be very expensive so you know pharmaceutical representatives are not coming after you telling you what you should prescribe and why you should prescribe it because it's it's not worth their time or effort and and i think a part of it is maybe a lot of them just had standard prescriptions you know a lot of tb prescriptions are supposed to be tailored to a person's weight and you know maybe they've just been used to prescribing a certain thing and you know just having a standard copy paste prescription for everybody that it just made their lives easier with the volumes of people they were dealing with maybe maybe that was one of the reasons why that happened what also strikes me out of what your uh, your wonderful answer a while back was that the study of medicine can take you in two uh, opposite directions that on the one hand it can make a person in front of you less human because you're just noting down the details this is age this is a weight blah 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 and that's something you need to watch out for and as you said you were fortunate to have a doctor who you know made you cognizant and mindful of these things but on the other hand it can also make them more human in the sense that we look at ourselves and the people all around us as if everybody's a mortal you know we don't consider our own mortality and we even take others for granted for that reason but i am guessing that once you start studying medicine and it becomes explicit to you that this is a body and this is how the body functions and eventually it kind of breaks down does that then change the way that you look at others that that veneer of immortality goes down and you know you might for example go to a wedding and your aunt will complain about how your uncle is snoring so much at an earlier date that is just an endearing detail but suddenly you are now asking your uncle about his throat muscles his uvula does he sleep on his side or not you know any thoughts on these two like very different aspects you've already commented on the first one where you have to be mindful and treat them as actual people but uh, the other one does it does it kind of change the way that you look at others and your self and your own body that there are things that you would otherwise take for granted and you see others take for granted but you don't anymore because you know enough of the body to know that no this this is stuff i need to kind of focus on so that's the unfortunate part at at, at a certain level because uh you look at everything probabilistically right you start analyzing everything around you in terms of probabilities so if you know that your loved one has a particular disease you're already calculating probabilities of hospitalization probabilities of bad outcomes probabilities of what might happen so you're also a party pooper right at the end of the day like you rightly pointed out you point out things to people who were blissfully unaware of some things and were living a happy life and now suddenly you've added to the problems on their plate and and that's a fine balance sometimes because is uh, i i run a smoking cessation clinic for example now you know a lot of people who smoke clearly know that it's not good for them so you know catching hold of someone and pointing out the obvious to them is not necessarily in their best interest but you end up nudging people in the right direction yes you know because you're more sensitized to the fact that you know what you what you are seeing cannot be unseen so if you're seeing an individual who clearly like you said has a neck which is bulky fits into a certain profile you know you're almost tempted to ask okay do you snow or do you you know th- you go down a uh, an inquisitive pathway but i think that has to be done with a lot of sensitivity as well you know that that's the other thing about life right there is a what we call the natural history of disease so not everybody with a particular condition is necessarily going to deteriorate not everybody is going to follow a particular trajectory so when you're actually eyeballing somebody and screening them you're in effect doing a screening test and your screening tests are solid only if you know the natural history and you know that intervening is going to make a difference so when i tend to do that i i need to be reasonably certain that i'm giving advice that is going to possibly alter the trajectory of an individual's life otherwise it's a little tricky to get into those situations 
right one of the things that you kind of also then have to do is confront the limits of medicine like the instinct obviously is i want to help the patient has come the patient also wants medicine the patient expects treatment but sometimes you run into these natural limits where there's not much you can do the patient behavior has to change you have only so much control over that like when i go to my gp uh, an endearing gentleman named dr kothari in lokhandwala who has i think 400 ganesha idols in his office a lovely gentleman and the one thing he will no matter what i go to him with he will tell me that amit stop eating outside food or amit you must uh, you know uh, get enough sleep uh, both of which are true but th- there's a limit to how much control you have over somebody's behavior which is one of the limits of medicine and the other limit of medicine is that there are areas in which we simply haven't advanced enough like if a particular disease has advanced you know probabilistically i mean you can't be cold and brutal and tell them that these are the probabilities you know at best 5 years at worst 6 months but you know that becomes difficult and sometimes there are diseases where you know maybe like gerd for example where you can't cure the thing it, it's just uh, you know it is what it is so how does one deal with them because a patient expectation always is of the doctor as a kind of a god who's got a solution for everything who better have a solution for everything i think empathy plays a very important role in that situation where uh, it's a shared journey it's a shared experience it's not didactic it's not one way it's uh, nudging people in the right direction and as you rightly pointed out a lot of them have already connected the dots when it comes to lifestyle choices and lifestyle changes i think it's useful to just nudge people in the right direction and offer them help wherever possible smoking cessation for example you know there are medications which help you know and a lot of people aren't aware of these medications so we tend to you know treat them as you would treat any other disease there's no judgment involved there's no there's no uh, you know point of wagging a finger at the person and saying this is wrong you accept the person for who they are you try to help them to whatever extent and then you also you know for diseases as you rightly pointed out you may not have a cure so you you be transparent in that process i think it's important not to tell you know there there is a school of medicine which constantly reassures patients i'm i i very often don't reassure patients and in in the sense that i say listen this is what we are going to try it may or may not work if it doesn't work you know we will try something else i have very often offered patients to go and seek a second opinion i say listen you know maybe you should see another doctor you know well, maybe maybe there are people who've dealt with this in a different way and have met with success i i don't claim to have all the answers i think that's the kind of transparency that's really important the other end of the spectrum and you know which gets me again really disturbed is is end of life care where very often i think it's the the onus is on the doctor to kind of help the patient and tell them that listen this is not a situation in which you need to prolong care you you know you feel obliged to prolong care forever and that's one thing that really riles me gets me very disturbed when i see people you know in their who clearly are not doing well who clearly are on multiple drugs multiple supports and you know the family says just keep going on keep going on i think there's a huge responsibility on the physician to navigate that situation and help individuals realize this is not what you would want for yourself so please don't subject somebody you love to what you're currently doing and this this is a common theme i ask individuals you know who have their loved ones on on ventilators and multiple supports clearly not doing well you know i i very often ask them i said would you want this for yourself 30 years from now or so if you you were in this situation and very often the answer is a very absolute emphatic no then i asked them would you would would your loved one you know had you had this conversation with them 10 years ago and said listen 10 years from now you will be in this situation you will be on multiple supports would you want everything to be done at that point or would you want us to let you go at that point and they will say you know oh i know my dad he would definitely not want to be in this situation and yet we perpetuate this you know as you rightly said you know this is the same analogy of a disease that has no cure there are certain situations where there is no hope you know or the or the hope is such that the person will never live a meaningful life again and i think that's where a physician the onus is really on us uh, to help individuals make the right choice Yeah there's a there's a great book by Atul Gawande called Being Mortal which is just about this and it also strikes me that you know one thing that people might not think about so much but I'm sure you have and I'm sure doctors do is that the responsibility is not just to prolong life but sometimes also to enhance quality of life and sometimes there is a trade off and what you you know must have faced is the difficult situation where you actually have to tell a patient that listen stop the treatment 
what is that situation like and also in all your years of practice are there moments which were difficult for you that were really hard that made you wonder that why am i putting myself through this like i understand the gratification of helping so many people in small small ways but there are also these painful moments where you can't help them anymore uh, so how does one kind of deal with that tell me a bit about it so this to me is one of the most painful situations and and unfortunately it's getting more and more frequent having to deal with it you know where uh, individuals have reached a point where they clearly are not going to recover where they are on multiple supports where life is just being prolonged but not there's, there's no quality to that life at all and yet modern medicine gives us this whole illusion of keeping a person alive right the word alive itself is 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 very debatable in this context i find this extremely difficult to do you know i was reading an article recently the title of the article was how doctors die and it was a very interesting article which talks about how when doctors themselves get diagnosed with certain conditions they choose to just go to a house somewhere in the wilderness live quietly spend the last 6 months you know with their family have quality time and and just pass away quietly when they themselves have to deal with situations like that and yet you know we offer a lot more to patients than we should now part of that is is of course you know that there is litigation that everybody is also afraid of that how could you not do anything in a situation like this which is why i think it's very important to have advanced directives you know legal advanced directives in place if you've thought about it and if if you don't want to be subjected to something when you reach a point but in the absence of an advanced directive you know most doctors will end up doing everything that the patient's family tells them to do and uh, i find this extremely difficult so i've i've dealt with situations where there were individuals who were leading lives where they were almost non-communicative for 5 and 6 years you know post after a stroke but the loved ones would want to keep on going on get them admitted frequently so there's zero communication there is no evidence of what what we would normally perceive as being a living human being and yet we would keep prolonging the the situation just because you know the family has resources the family has money the family is ready to pay you know so who are you to question this decision and uh, one of the solutions offered in this article written by this doctor was that if you're uncomfortable with the situation you need to transfer care to another physician i've never i've never thought of doing that but you know after reading this article it really made me wonder whether i should start doing that because it goes against every belief that i believe in it goes against my training you know i i trained to become a doctor not just to save lives but to add some meaning to those lives to to add some quality to those lives and uh, as you rightly said you know atul gavande's book talks about how I think about 50% of your of your lifetime cost on medicine or medical care happens in the last one month of your life. So it's it's that stock that just because we have the ability to put people on ventilators to start infusions and bring their blood pressure up to start dialysis and you know get their kidneys functioning just because we have this ability we've started doing things which are which are possibly not always in the patient's best interest. Yeah, and also you know within the culture we might romanticize uh, things like you know in in Dylan Thomas's famous words to rage rage against the dying of the light, whereas I would certainly in that situation just like to have the grace to just go quietly and save everybody and myself the trouble, which you know brings me to euthanasia. Like, what, what do you feel about euthanasia? Like, some countries have kind of moved towards uh, legalizing it, and for those who don't know, euthanasia is where at the end of your life you choose to just kind of go when you have a fatal disease or such like. And and the two issues that the two sort of related questions that come up is that in a country like India, uh, you know, where there is so much jogar and the rule of law doesn't really hold. If you were to legalize it, you know, it could become a pretext for people to just um, you know murder their older relatives and you know get the paperwork done to show that it's uh, euthanasia but at the same time if one agrees that euthanasia is a dignified uh, way to end life and that we should all have the right to end our lives then what do we uh, make of suicide in a general sense that you know even if you're not ill you know uh, suicide of course is criminalized here therefore becoming the one crime for which you get punished when you fail at it and is often correlated with the mental health issues and and there of course you know it is something to worry about but at the same time a completely cold rational person might say that i am not ill but i just don't want to go on and i have autonomy over my body so you know uh, are these are these kind of questions that you've thought about 
so i have uh, there's there's actually a very interesting documentary by the economist so you know economist does these small documentaries about this belgian mm-hmm. girl who was 24 and and uh, chose to get euthanized uh, it's it's extremely disturbing of course to watch it as well but uh, you know medically the dilemmas are of course whether it's active or it's passive so active euthanasia is where a doctor plays a role in actually ending a person's life and that goes against uh, the oath that goes against the hippocrates oath where we are not supposed to actively help anyone die that's that's not what our skill sets are designed to do then there's passive euthanasia where you set it up for the patient but the patient presses the button the patient pulls the trigger the patient figures out or the person let's not use the word patient uh, uh figures out uh, when the time is right and and they want to go down that road now the the problem is that i absolutely agree with the autonomy part of things and and i think it's fair i think it's it's better to go down that road when it's done as an advance directive when something is decided not when the time comes which may cloud your ability to make a calm rational decision but it's done in advance so i think advance directives are very nice uh, in terms of saying listen if i reach a point where you have to do cardiopulmonary resuscitation on me i don't want that being done so the no code principle right people have bracelets which say that that i don't want a code i think that's relatively straightforward in terms of ethical frameworks i think what's more challenging is what you just described that you're not overtly suffering and yet you've decided that enough is enough and you want to go at at your prime rather than go down a pathway where where you suffer i have thought of that and and i don't think there's an easy answer to that unfortunately because religion comes into play personal beliefs come into play the stole slippery slope where do you draw the line you know where is the line at which you say it's okay to do it and what is our role as a society in terms of protecting the individual from making a step that we, that is so detrimental to them you know do we have some sort of an obligation to protect that individual in terms of counseling in terms of going through a process and to the best of my knowledge the countries that do allow euthanasia also have certain measures in place where you need to go through a certain level of counseling you need to go through psychiatric evaluation everyone needs to be convinced that it's a it's a rational decision there is a situation which is irretrievable in some way and only then you're allowed to uh, to go ahead with the decision yeah many many fascinating uh, ethical questions in play there before we go in for a break a question harking back to something that you said earlier where you spoke about how uh you'd like to see more of the humanities being taught in uh, medicine and i completely get that because there is a danger that otherwise you know you could just have a one track thing where you know how medicines interact with the body and that's kind of it and obviously it's more important to have a more well rounded approach towards humanity and also you spoke about um, almost wistfully of the path roads not taken as it were right at the start where you spoke about one could have been an author or whatever was there stuff like that in your mind at any point that were you interested like what kind of books did you read what were you outside the context of medicine and uh, the study of medicine what were you reading did you want to be a writer you know when you read people like say atul gawande or abraham verghese or eric topol or whatever uh, do you think that hey okay i should also be uh, you know going down that road uh, tell me a bit about that so it's it's definitely on the bucket list and i i do hope i will i will write something some day of uh, of relevance and interest to to some readers at least i think a lot of my passion or my hunger for writing comes out in scientific literature and publications in so that's that's kind of an outlet in a way the reason i could be a little prolific was because i really enjoyed writing for me to construct something out of nothing is is very fascinating but this this concept of uh, of humanities also comes from uh, how fascinating science is right so when i did my epidemiology i realized that a lot of epidemiological principles actually came from economics and a lot of them came from philosophy if you look at uh, you know we use something called p value right uh, so a p value basically is a measure of statistical significance right so and when it's below a certain level like 0.05 is a cut off we say that this this is something that's rare this is something that's uh, that that cannot happen by chance so there is definitely a genuine association so when you look at is drug a better than drug b if the p value is less than 0.05 you say yes it's better and it's beyond reasonable doubt or beyond beyond chance now if you go back the real argument comes from from something latin which is reductio ab absurdum you basically reduce the argument to a level that it's absurd that the alternative is true and then you prove the truth accordingly so that that basically is coming from philosophy and and i think if we were trained 
in some sort of philosophy, in some sort of critical thinking, I think all of us would become much better doctors because it wouldn't be that this is written in stone. We would learn to question things. We would learn context in a, in a lot of different ways. And this whole realization that, and, and when I say humanities, I don't necessarily mean the appreciation of art. I mean, things which actually eventually led to medicine in so many different ways. Abraham Varghese, to, to answer your second question, I think Abraham Varghese, my own country was one of my favorite books of all time, probably, because again, you know, it was the empathy that someone working at the start of the HIV pandemic in a small little town, the whole people coming out of the closet at that point of time, I think it was fascinating in terms of contextualizing medicine and not making it just cold, hard facts. Complications, again, by Gavande was a great, great book, uh, his first book, and uh, you know, he's written some after that which weren't as impressive, let's put it that way. But I thought Complications was was fascinating. I pretty much read anything. I, I don't think I'm very selective about what I read. I think The Looming Tower was the last last book that I can think of recently that I really liked. There's, there's this book called Do No Harm uh, by a guy called Henry Marsh, who's a neurosurgeon in the UK. And I thought it was a fantastic book. It's a book I read a couple of years ago where he's so brutally honest about the mistakes that he's made. And he's so, and he can probably do it because he's, relatively senior now and you know some of the stuff that he talks about would have potentially lawsuit material but but he's being so brutally honest about the uncertainties associated with medicine and and I find that fascinating you know I think I think doctors need to be a lot more humble than they are because there is so much uncertainty there is on on a daily basis you know I see patients in my clinic I send them off home there is a small proportion of those patients who anything can happen the moment they leave out of my office, right? And, and uh, you know, that, that uncertainty, I think quantifying that uncertainty and trying to become a better doctor, knowing that uncertainty is out there is, is what fascinates me. And I think, you know, it's, it's a blend of philosophical, logical reasoning. It's a blend of accepting that uncertainty. It's, it's, it's a blend of this whole principle of do no harm, right? So the, the burden of proof is always on us to prove that things work. It's never on, you know, let's try something. If it doesn't work, then let's chuck it because it's human lives that you're dealing with. And I, I think that structure of logic and argument also comes from the humanities, which I find very fascinating. So I had a recent episode with uh, another person who's been a voice of reason in these COVID months, which is Gautam Menon. And Gautam also spoke about bringing different lenses to bear. Like uh, he brings a lens of physics into biology and biology into physics. And he's also got statistical training and all these lenses help. So do you find yourself a applying the lenses and the frames that you've got from your study of medicine into the world at large and vice versa like do you apply other frames like one book that a lot of my guests seem to have liked and recommended on the show is a book called the rules of contagion by adam kucharski and there of course you realize that contagion is not just in the biological sense of how a disease spreads but similar rules and similar trends can apply to even uh, you know contagion when it comes to information for example so do you find yourself doing this kind of interdisciplinary sort of applying of frames of from one thing to another? And then uh, uh, how much do you feel that that enriches your understanding? No, absolutely. I mean, I can be pretty annoying to a lot of people sometimes because uh, because of this inherent cynicism that comes from epidemiology, right? So everything is is in the realm of probability. So there's no certainty at all. Everything is like, what is the counterfactual? You know, what if this didn't happen and something else had happened is what you're trying to prove. And since you never have a counterfactual, you try to come as close to that counterfactual as you can. And I and, and that spills over to everything in life. So every time somebody is talking about, you know, say arranged marriage is better than love marriage, for example, and you're saying, you know, what are the selection biases? Are individuals who get into an arranged marriage different from individuals who get into a love marriage? What are the confounding variables? You know, are they more wealthy and therefore have a safety net to go back to if they, you know, if it fails versus in one versus the other? And you're 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 constantly dissecting it out in in every aspect of your life, and I and I think that's that's the fun of the generalizability of the same principles across everything uh, around you. There's this fascinating story which I love telling, and you know I'm going to use this opportunity to uh, to speak about please, it. Please, please. There was this guy called uh, Abraham Wald, and this was the Second World War. Um, this was 1943. Abraham Wald was a was a biostatistician, uh, was a statistician. 
And he was uh, assigned to try and figure out why so many planes were getting shot down. Uh, and, and, you know, how, how could those planes be reinforced? How could they make those, those weak spots stronger? Uh, he was given this data set where they had this whole bunch of planes and all the bullet holes on the planes were mapped on it. And he looked at all of them and, you know, it was clearly uh, that the wings, the fuselage and the tails, you know, these were the three areas that were hit the most. And, you know, as one would normally expect, the person would say, you know, reinforce the wings, the tails and the fuselage because they hit the most. And what he said was just the opposite. He said, everything other than the wings, the fuselage and the tails needs to be reinforced because these are the planes that came back to the to the base. The ones that were lost out were obviously hit in the other areas, you know. So that was his survivor bias. The ones that survived and came back clearly we did okay despite all the bullet holes in all these areas the ones that didn't were hit in the other areas i think that's fascinating stuff and and you know these principles apply to everything in life if, if you just look at the data set and you don't have the broader picture as to why that data is in front of you and what's the context in which it is you will end up making a lot of biased and flawed decisions yeah, that's actually one of my favorite stories as well. And Wald, in fact, served on a committee at one point in time with Milton Friedman and a few other uh, eminent people whose names I forget. But I think Friedman once commented something to the effect of how it felt to be in a room where everyone was smarter than you, which for someone like Friedman to say is pretty uh, remarkable. And, you know, I, I think I get that feeling uh, from the scene and the unseen as well, uh, that uh, every week I'm basically the second smartest person in the conversation if there is only one guest. But we'll uh, now take a quick commercial break. And on the other side of the commercial break, we'll continue talking about the practice of medicine. We'll look at some of your pet areas like smoking cessation and sleep, both of which I want to talk a little bit uh, more about. And then finally, we'll talk about COVID-19 as well, you know, where you have always kind of been a little bit ahead of the curve and showing the way to others. So uh, all that after a quick break. Long before I was a podcaster, I was a writer. In fact, chances are that many of you first heard of me because of my blog India Uncut, which was active between 2003 and 2009 and became somewhat popular at the time. I love the freedom the form gave me and I feel I was shaped by it in many ways. I exercised my writing muscle every day and was forced to think about many different things because I wrote about many different things. Well, that phase in my life ended for various reasons and now it is time to revive it. Only now I am doing it through a newsletter. I have started the India Uncut newsletter at indiauncut.substack.com where I will write regularly about whatever catches my fancy. I'll write about some of the themes I cover in this podcast and about much else. So please do head on over to indiauncut.substack.com and subscribe. It is free. Once you sign up, each new installment that I write will land up in your email inbox. You don't need to go anywhere. So subscribe now for free. The India Uncut newsletter at indiauncut.substack.com. Thank you. Welcome back to The Scene and the Unseen. I'm chatting with Dr. Lancelot Pinto about uh, the practice of medicine and uh, especially in the narrowed down context of COVID-19 in the last few months. But as we continue this fascinating discussion, uh, Lance, I'm uh, reminded of something you said just before the break, which brings me to my next question. But before that, uh, you know, a quick anecdote about the president, Harry Truman, who once when he was president said, give me a one handed economist. And he did not mean this in a literal way. But what he meant was his, his advisors would keep saying to him, on the one hand, this, on the other hand, that. And he just wanted, uh, you know, uh, he wanted to make decisions. He wanted things straight up. Now, you mentioned probabilistic thinking uh, a few times in this episode so far, which is music to my ears. I mean, I was a, a professional poker player for a few years and uh, that kind of taught me to look at everything in the world around us in a probabilistic manner. But most people don't. Most people crave certainties. And of course, we always ascribe certainty to the past. Like after something has happened, it has 100% happened or 0% happened. And it's easy to kind of look at it like that. But even for the future, they want a similar kind of certainty. So as a medical practitioner, how how is it for you where you want to explain something in probabilistic terms, but you know that the other person in a manner of speaking wants a one-handed doctor? Uh, how do you deal with that? This is a challenge I, I pretty much face on a daily basis because... Uh, you know, at the end of every conversation, the patient often will say, but something will happen, or, you know, some, some broad, definite statement is made at the end, and they want me to say yes. And, and I find it extremely difficult to do that. 
पर कुछ बुरा तो नहीं होगा बट नथिंग बैड विल हैपन बट यू नो इन टू मंथ विल वी विल गेट बेटर राइट यू नो सो इट्स 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 दीज डेफिनेट एप्सल्यूट दैट पीपल कॉन्स्टेंटली सीक एंड इट मेक्स द होल कॉन्वर्सेशन अ लॉट क्विकर इफ आई वॉज इन द प्रोबेबलिस्टिक थिंक ऑफ यू नो अनफॉर्चुनेटली आई एम सो इट मेक्स माई कॉन्सर्ट लॉन्गर एज अ कॉन्सिक्वेंस वेर आई एम ट्राइंग टू एक्सप्लेन दैट आई डू होप दैट थिंग्स गेट बेटर फॉर यू एंड आई डू वॉन्ट थिंग्स टू गेट बेटर फॉर यू but i can't guarantee that that's going to happen you know and that's that's true for a significant chunk of diseases especially at a specialist level you know so if if you're if you're dealing in the community and somebody comes to you with the sniffles for example you can say with reasonable degree of certainty that out of 100 people i treat like this 99 are going to get better so you know i can i can afford to tell all 100 that things are going to get better and be wrong once and you know have that guy say but you know listen you said that i would get better and you know have that conversation again at uh, the more specialized you get in terms of you know people being referred to you after somebody has had a look at them already after someone has tried something already it's not worked then they come to you it's not because the person who's tried something very often has done something wrong it's just that the nature of the illness is such that there's a lot of uncertainty around certain diseases and certain conditions and i think being a communicator in such a situation is difficult it's it's challenging but i think at the same time it's 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 a challenge that we need to take on in a in a positive kind of way in an, in in an empowering kind of way not so you empower the patient to know about what they are going through rather than look down on the patient and try and say things like so i've heard this phrase so many times right you are you are a google patient you know like tum jao you go and google it you know and my doctor told me yeah 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 this is what you must have got from google there are these memes floating around or these jokes floating around on whatsapp saying google patients not wanted or something like that right i i see nothing wrong in that i see nothing wrong in a person googling i mean it's his or her body you know you're going to a doctor the doctor is going to violate that sanctity of space and you know give you something to put into your own body why should you not be empowered and educated about what's what's happening there you know so what's so wrong if i do my google search in fact why don't you i mean as a doctor why don't you suggest a better way to google search you train the patient say listen don't go to google find google may have taught you this don't look down on your patient and say oh yeah this is rubbish instead say why don't you go to this legitimate site which has legitimate information and you come to the same conclusion so to answer your question and very often i think people have done studies on this also where they look at you know what the doctor says and what the patient takes away are two different things sometimes so no matter how much you try to explain probabilities the patient often goes away saying speaking in absolutes the doctor said things will get better or the doctor says things will get things are not going to get better and sometimes you know if they go away with the feeling that the doctor said that there's no hope you know if that's their interpretation of things that's the first cue for them to jump and go to another doctor if they find a doctor who deals with absolutes they are then happy you know it is a big challenge uh, and uh, and there's no easy solution to this because if i have to stay honest i have to speak in terms of probabilities if i go black or white then i'm not being honest to myself so you know i mean this is just who i am and hopefully a significant proportion of patients do understand that it's coming from the right and good place for my listeners who must now all be intrigued and saying that oh you know tell us how to google so why don't you why don't you give us a quick 1 minute or 2 minute clinic on how to get information how to be a google patient so to say uh, like where should they go uh, where should they begin and what should they watch out for so most websites so just like up to date is something that i alluded to earlier up to date has a patient version as well so for every article that's there about a particular disease there's a patient information sheet which is also available which is coming from a legitimate source the second thing a lot of journals nowadays do so uh, journals have started having their social media sites as well which are quite active and uh, and a lot of that is targeted towards the end user or the patient so there will be a professional summary and there will be a patient summary very often the cochrane collaboration right so so basically what happens in medicine is once you have a whole bunch of studies which are out there on a particular subject uh, what people do is they synthesize this information and do do what we call systematic reviews so systematic reviews are currently considered the highest level of evidence because it's a summary of everything that's out there and the cochrane collaboration is is one of the collaborations that consistently does systematic reviews on important subjects and again on their summary page at the bottom there is a patient summary So if you go to the Cochrane collaboration website on a particular topic that you are interested in you will get a patient lay person summary which is not technical or uh, which will help you you can also ask your doctor you know because again most of us are part part of professional associations so when it comes to respiratory there's the American Thoracic Society there is the American College of Chest Physicians as the British Thoracic Society all of these societies have lay person versions of most articles that are published there 
So I think I think going through le- through legitimate societies and then trying to figure out what the layperson version is is far better than looking at an opinion or an op-ed that someone has just posted out there, which may be biased. Great point, sir. Let's now talk about some of your pet themes. But before we do that, a quick word on you know your MSc, which you did in McGill University, epidemiology. What kind of made you go for that? Because the subject, of course, is fascinating. Like you said, you know, insights from many different fields come to bear upon that: economics, statistics, philosophy, as you pointed out, all of that. What made you go for that? And then, you know, what drove you towards some of your like? What are your current? Uh, you know, apart from COVID nineteen, what are your current sort of areas into which you've gone into rabbit holes and become a specialist, so to say, and why? So McGill again, you know, happened by chance uh, because of the TB study, because of the TB work that we've done out here. Um, Madhukar Pai, who's a professor at McGill and is a is one of the top TB guys in the world uh, in TB diagnostics, he offered me this opportunity to do a master's in epidemiology. I got mixed feedback from people around me. A lot of people told me that it was a big mistake because I was stepping out of clinical medicine for two years. I was very jittery about it because you know. a doctor going away and you know going back to school in a way staying away from patients for 2 years will i be employable when i come back if i decide to come back after 2 years it was a big challenge I, i think a lot of big deal of the credit goes to dr odwadia who at that point of time told me that if he were in my shoes and had an opportunity at that point of time he would accept it in the blink of an eye and and in that sense it was a leap of faith and and again the epidemiology almost didn't happen because there were certain math requirements to get into an msc epidemiology which i didn't have on my transcript and it took a lot of pleading and kind of you know reassurances on on the part of madhupai and other people which then you know made them kind of waive off that requirement um so that's that's how mikil happened and and i had no concept of how important mikil was as a school i think i realized it once i went out there so the, i mean as one of the introductions that uh, happen when you go to mikil is that they sell t-shirts outside during orientation which says harvard and below that it says america's mcgill you know so that's 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 the joke they have there but it's it's a great university it, in terms of respiratory medicine a lot of good stuff has come out from mcgill it was where william osler was so it's it's a it's a mecca in some ways it's where the brain was mapped by uh, dr penfield and the department of epidemiology was again it, it was a real solid department so i was coming out of a residency right so 3 years of a residency you hardly slept you work like really hard so i thought this is going to be a piece of cake you know what is an what is a masters you know i mean it's, it's like it's going to be child's play and it was grilling it was grueling two years where you know i didn't sleep much because it was assignment after assignment it was stuff that i had no idea about you know you were going back to probability and maths and bayesian stuff learning statistical software it was extremely challenging and you know half of your class is really young and half of cl- half of the class so i was about 35 and we had a bunch of people who were like 24 who had just come out of their bachelors and were directly doing it and you know half of our class is your age so you know and then you have to do group assignments which people have with people 10 years younger than you and those 10 years do matter right when you're talking about 24 versus 35 so it was it was a fascinating experience and again you know we had some great professors we had madhu himself was a great mentor he's somebody who who's a machine in terms of working you know you send him an email at any time of the day somehow he manages to reply and i still see that happening there was great tb work happening it was a it was a bunch of people who worked in collaboration i mean i truly appreciated the power of collaborative work as well so people were not necessarily competing with each other people were all complementing each other and and supporting people to grow in terms of rabbit holes i got very passionate about medical ethics i i attended a class by a guy called jonathan kimmelman who was brilliant in terms of ethics my understanding of ethics completely took a 180 degree you know you know all of us think of ethics as being some sort of a field which is you know does it feel right does it feel wrong you know what does it feel does it conflict with your morals and that kind of stuff and then i realized that it the thing that he kept saying over and over again in the class is that this is a science this is not based on a gut feel there is a framework in which it works and you know something that may be wrong in one framework could be right in another framework and i think that's pretty much similar to how economics works as well right in terms of you know it's the framework that matters and decides what's acceptable and what's not not acceptable even in terms of epidemiology you know this this whole we used to have this whole critiquing of papers you know which went on for hours sometimes everybody pointing out how things could be done in a better way how things could be done differently and i i think that made a huge difference in terms of how i looked at everything after that so 
it it adds a lot of uncertainty unfortunately to your life so i went there certain and i came back uncertain in, in a lot of ways so in terms of the practice of medicine you know from knowing all the answers it came to almost knowing nothing anymore which in some ways is great but in some ways is makes you a little cynical you know every time there's a new study i'm like we'll see you know that's my usual answer versus saying oh wow there's this wonder drug you know this is going to change everything so my levels of cynicism have increased significantly but i genuinely believe that that was a great experience that is so fascinating i mean can you give me a concrete example of where this would apply in your everyday practice that levels of certainty having gone down and which is of course the way knowledge works the more you know the more you realize there is more to know but in your case in practical terms uh, how did it change like obviously you would have looked at medicine in a more probabilistic way but apart from that how did it sort of uh, change your practice as it were so let's again i'll give you a cynical example like so when remdesivir got announced i don't know if you remember that moment yeah okay. uh, it was it was fauci at the white house next to trump and he says you know this is a pivotal moment in the history of covid and it reminds me of hiv and it reminds me of how we changed everything and my first reaction was this is the head of nid right i think that's what it's called the national institute of allergy and diseases he was the guy who conducted the study and he was announcing it at the white house rather than announcing it in a publication so i was like there's a lot of conflict of interest out there you know you need to angle it. let the science come out let the paper come out we'll have a look at what it says we'll have a look at whether it's a game changer or not so this this inherent blind faith in individuals institutions i think that's been shaken a lot and and, and in a healthy way you know i mean i don't i don't have anything against fauci obviously and you know we all respect him and he's been he's been a great voice of reason throughout all of this but you know i've learned to question everything in terms of you know the god being in the details in, in a way yeah and rem- remdesivir was also is almost seems like a drug of hope in the sense it was used during ebola also if i remember correctly and they said it is going to be the wonder drug and it really didn't do anything there you know speaking of fauci just a quick aside some friends and i had a session recently on conspiracy theories and uh, fauci of course is at the center of many conspiracy theories and many people claiming he created the covid virus and all that these guys are bizarre so we had like this fantasy situation where fauci uh, sushant singh rajput and subhash chandra bose went in a ufo to blow up the world trade center so you know you're bringing many conspiracy theories right. <laughs> uh, together but before moving on uh, you know everything you say is so fascinating there are all these side lights i want to explore i also want to talk a little bit about that ethics part where you said you looked at it completely differently in the sense that it now gave you a much more clearly defined framework to think about medical ethics and it wasn't just about intuition and whether something feels icky or not but uh, can you tell me a little bit more about that framework which you used to think through issues of medical ethics now it's like this whole free market versus you know what is governed by uh, the government or you know government controlled healthcare for example this this whole debate about what is right and what is wrong you know so the private sector becomes a very easy target to bash up you know saying that private sector is after money private sector is after incentives this is a framework that has been allowed by whoever decides what the framework is once the framework is in place i feel it is wrong to criticize a for profit entity for doing what they try to do to make a profit right so it's 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 you've defined that this is the framework you've defined that you should allow this framework to work and then deciding what is right and wrong becomes a very blurry line once you've once you've created that sort of a framework this whole concept of you know if you look at uh, what is the worth of a life or what is the value of a life right it sounds horrible to say that you know from a sentimental perspective right but if you look at it in terms of how much are you ready to spend to save that one life that's how economics works in terms of healthcare everything works in terms of metrics where they look at you know the the cost versus the benefit for every particular thing and that again is defined in some sort of a framework we have accepted like i think the uk at some point of time said that one dally or one you know disability adjusted life year was equal to 20000 pounds or something like that so somebody came up with that framework and said that this is what we are ready to spend on an individual in the country paid by taxpayer money to save one year of productive life right so earlier all of these things would have been nauseating in some ways would have been like how can you ever look at health this way but that's the practicalities of the universe we work in frameworks we work in in a, in some sort of an ethical framework that we choose to decide is acceptable to us as a society 
And once you accept that framework, then the, the, the whole argument about right versus wrong, good versus bad has to happen within that framework. You can't start making arguments outside that framework and saying something is wrong. So that's what the whole ethical principles made me realize. This whole, this whole training in ethics, whatever little I did in ethics, made me realize that there are different ways of looking at the same thing and there is no right way. You know, this whole uh, utilitarianism versus, uh, you know, some other, other schools of thought where it's not just the utility of, of a particular thing that's being analyzed, but it's, it's something else. And I don't claim to understand all of it. It's clearly, you know, it's, it's esoteric stuff. Uh, but it just makes you realize that to call something right or wrong or to call something ethical or unethical should not come from a gut feeling or should not come from a place of emotion. It needs to come from a framework in which you, you analyze these parameters. Yeah, and these frameworks can be complex and subjective. For example, just a thought that comes to mind that supposing you're in a hospital where COVID patients are rushing in and you don't have enough beds or oxygen and you have to try as you have to choose who do you give treatment to. So on the one hand, you could say the old people are more vulnerable, give oxygen to them. On the other hand, you could say that the young people have more productive years of life left, give oxygen to them instead. And then you start weighing up, you know, what is the probability of old person surviving or dying? What is the probability of young person surviving? surviving or dying how do you put a value on each extra year that each person might have so implicitly you know you are doing it now whether you do it in an explicit way where you put numbers to this or not or you do it implicitly and you go with whatever your moral instinct as it were is that no we have to save the old or no you know or the other way around you are making these icky decisions so what sometimes we need to do is we need to sort of be explicit and try to actually think this stuff out Right. So take the other example of schools, right? So I have twins who are six and a half years old who've missed one year of school, who are very likely to miss the second year of school as well. And, you know, in an ethical framework, in terms of, you know, what is right, what is wrong, we always speak about our responsibilities towards children, right? They're the vulnerable in the society. So, so we have to speak on their behalf. We have to lobby. We have to fight on their behalf. And, and they've not really had a voice in this pandemic, right? We've just decided that despite the fact that children hardly ever get affected. So it's it's an extremely small proportion of kids who fall sick enough to be hospitalized or sick enough to have worse outcomes. Extremely, like it's almost negligible. And yet we are subjecting them to two years of a lack of social interaction, two years of meeting their friends, two years of sports, two years of everything, with the argument that it's being done to protect the elderly because they're going to go back home and the elderly are vulnerable. They're going to have people who have other vulnerabilities at home and we need to protect them. Now, this is where ethics comes into play, right? I mean, this is a this is a difficult question to answer. What is the worth of those two years of social interaction and education in a child's life versus protecting an elderly individual? And, you know, there's no straight answer. There's no easy answer to this. But it's interesting when at least you generate a debate around these things. Yeah, and, and, and the sort of problem I've always had with utilitarianism is that utilitarianism depends on calculating the utility of different actions, which is impossible to do. Like, it's incalculable. If a kid is losing two years of a school life, it is incalculable. You don't have any idea. Uh, by incalculable, I don't mean incredibly, infinitely high. I just mean that you literally cannot calculate it. You don't know what the psychological impact will be. You don't know what the human capital impact will be in terms of what they might have learned or how they are socialized and all of those things you simply don't know so if you are just going to take a utilitarian calculus then eventually you will be putting subjective values out there in terms of this is how much i would value this and all that which will go down to your own biases and therefore become completely unscientific but yeah it's a really fascinating uh, and muddy field let's come back to you know one of your pet subjects uh, which is uh, sleep like you mentioned how in your practice you wouldn't sleep enough and you thought the masters would be easy but you found that during the masters also you're not getting enough sleep and that is a classic instance of a doctor not following his own advice because your advice to people constantly is that get enough sleep sleep is incredibly important and a subject close to my heart because i have sleep apnea by the way i'm i'm uh, you know on a cpap machine and uh, it changed the quality of my life in multiple ways which i'll kind of get into but i i just think that this is something that everyone needs to be aware of because especially when we are young the notion of just working constantly and staying up nights and all that is so romanticized even in some 
corporate jobs it is like considered natural that you you stay till late night and all of that and and these lifestyles have an impact not just in terms of the short term impact of oh you're sleepy the next day but they have a massive long term impact on health including possibly as people are uh, finding out raising the probability of uh, alzheimers uh, getting alzheimers later on so tell me a little bit about this because it just seems to be such an important area that there is not enough public awareness about so sleep is is fascinating right i mean if you look at the the raw data we spend a third of our life sleeping and that would convert into with an average lifespan of about 70 years you're effectively about 20 years of your life you're asleep and yet uh, the field of sleep medicine took off somewhere around the 70s you know that's where uh, a lot of research happened at the university of chicago uh, sleep apnea was described for the first time and it's it's a fascinating field for in many different ways and 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 a lot is being still researched so simple things like reaction time so there were experiments where they looked at you know tetris as a game that you know you gave a bunch of people let them play tetris half of them fell asleep half of them didn't were not allowed to sleep and you make them play again and the ones who fell to sleep there was extreme consolidation of of these patterns and memory to an extent that they did much 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 better the next morning versus the group that didn't fall asleep so that's short term that's quick quick results you know things like attention span things like memory Uh, I think there have been studies which have shown that one extra hour of sleep in school-going kids can reduce the incidence of attention deficit hyperactivity to a great extent, because kids, unlike adults, when they are sleep deprived, tend to get more irritable, tend to get more what we call hyper, as, as compared uh, to adults who would just just be sleepy. A lot of road traffic accidents have been attributed to the lack of sleep as well, or to sleep-related uh, disorders. these are like the low hanging fruit right but as you rightly pointed out that you know people are looking at associations between sleep apnea and uh, the development of cancers in the long run for example because it's what happens in sleep apnea is you have intermittent periods of time in the night where your oxygen levels are low so your cells are deprived of oxygen and then suddenly you wake up subconsciously and then your oxygen levels shoot up again so this what we call intermittent hypoxia that you're getting oxygen and you're not getting oxygen has been postulated to play a role even in the formation of cancers so pretty much every field so again the low hanging fruit the initial study showed the strong link with high blood pressure strong link with stroke possible link with heart disease as well so we've picked up the low hanging fruits and now the research is going into the subtler things unfortunately to pick up subtler things you need larger studies which involve lots of money and you know it, it takes a longer time to prove these things but we're realizing it more and more that that sleep is is crucial to uh, health in a lot of different ways and you're absolutely right we romanticize lack of sleep we almost use you know wear it as a badge to say that i worked so hard that i barely slept last night but clearly the science suggests that it's it's not something to be proud of and it's something that we really need to pay attention to yeah and i'll link to a fascinating talk on youtube that you uh, gave on this which had a bunch of insights and one of the insights i got on that was that uh, in the us vehicular accidents caused by drowsy driving exceed those caused by alcohol and drugs combined so you know it's not you don't just need to ban uh, drunk driving and people high on cocaine driving but you also need to sleep enough everybody needs to sleep enough a uh, sleep apnea for those who don't know is an extremely common condition what really happens is that because of a bunch of complex biological factors which you mentioned in your presentation so i won't go through that here that you your breathing keeps getting interrupted because of a temporary blockage in your airway because of which you keep waking up through the night and uh, one sign uh, of sleep apnea uh, possible sleep apnea is uh, snoring and of course 30 to 40% of people snore and only uh, 10% uh, have sleep apnea so it's not necessary that if you snore you have sleep apnea but uh, so i got myself tested for it and i got a cpap machine and the sleep apnea problem just solved but another interesting thing happened there which i've never actually spoken to a medical practitioner so i don't know if uh, it's even a good thing but it completely transformed my quality of life which is that for years since childhood i would often wake up in the morning with a sore throat and a blocked nose and the reason i figured out much later was gerd because of acid reflux and the moment i started using the cpap machine this just stopped 
I presumed it was because wind rushing into my respiratory system stopped the acid reflux. I mean, it didn't come all the way up to the nose and the throat, but it completely transformed my quality of life because before that, there was not a single day in my life that I hadn't woken up with a sore throat or a blocked nose, which I initially used to assume was, I didn't associate it with GERD. I thought it's a random respiratory thing. When I was a kid, my mother even took me to a homeopath in Pune, which is uh, kind of funny. So, uh, and I, I'm thinking that at one level, it's a good thing that treatment for something else has happened to have this impact here. But at the other level, it's a bad thing because what it is treating is a symptom and the underlying causes of GERD, which I might need to do something about, whether it's losing weight or whatever, is stuff that I'm not uh, handling. So do you sometimes uh, see this in your practice that you're treating something, but something else gets sorted or something counterintuitive like this happens? Like in this particular case, uh, what would your reaction be? There's a, there are a lot of associations with sleep apnea. I, you know, before I get into that, just to add to something you said earlier. So there, there was a study which looked at blood alcohol levels and sleep deprivation. And, and they actually did it in medical students and found that medical students post-call who were sleep deprived in terms of their cognitive performance performed very similar to people who had a reasonable amount of alcohol in their system. So, so that's, that's, you know, that's how bad sleep deprivation is. So there may be a lot of teetotalers out there who work really hard and feel that they're not drinking, but you know, they're probably causing an equal amount of damage by depriving themselves of, of sleep. So to get back to your question in terms of whether sleep apnea is connected to a lot of things, there are a lot, lots of fascinating things that happen. So sleep apnea basically is obstruction of the windpipe at the level of the throat, right? So it's generally fat at the base of the tongue, at the back of the tongue, which causes um, an obstruction out there. So what happens essentially is when you breathe in sleep apnea, so your windpipe is shut and you're breathing against the resistance of a shut windpipe. So imagine, you know, if you think about that experiment where, uh, you know, you have a diaphragm below a bottle and you pull the diaphragm down and the balloons fill up inside. I don't know if you've, uh, you know, we've, we've done this in school. This is like you're shutting that and you're pulling the diaphragm down, but you've shut down the way for the air to enter. So that puts a lot of negative pressure inside the chest. Now, this negative pressure inside the chest surprisingly causes the heart muscle to stretch. When the heart muscle stretches, it releases a substance called atrial natriuretic peptide, which causes you to basically pee. So it's very interesting that people with sleep apnea very often will pee three or four times every night in the severe form or at least once or twice every night. And the moment they start using the CPAP machine, that completely stops. So something that you wouldn't even think is related, right? You would think, why is my peeing frequency gone down when all you've done is push air down my throat? But that's how fascinating the human body is. There are so many things which are interconnected. So GERD is, is a very common comorbidity with sleep apnea because, again, you know, obesity, GERD and sleep apnea, you know, kind of form a triangle. And the treatment of sleep apnea, it's... it's it, very often gets rid of a lot of these corollary symptoms which you otherwise uh, would not have thought directly associated uh, with the disease. Blood pressure tends to come down by a few points. You know, heart rates tend to get better post, post sleep apnea. You know, something that's not spoken about, erectile dysfunction is sometimes very common in individuals who have sleep apnea as well. And that gets, you know, and we have a lot of urology referrals to us. So urologists who are up to date with the literature and sensitized enough to this connection have sent me patients of erectile dysfunction coming to a person, getting their sleep apnea treated, and then, you know, their erectile dysfunction getting better as well. So it's fascinating how things are related sometimes, you know, and, and it may not be very obvious in terms of physiology that it's air going down the respiratory system. So all its effects have to be related to the respiratory system. Yeah, you yeah, know, that's completely fascinating. So the, the fact that there are people out there with uh, erectile problems, uh, which are caused by uh, a throat muscle. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Doing something that I should is insanely fascinating. I didn't actually uh, imply that uh, my sleep apnea and GERD were necessarily linked. I think I've always had the GERD, but this just turned out to be a, the CPAP machine just turned out to be a Jugar solution sure. in whatever way. Uh, it works for that. And and that got me to thinking about Jugar solutions because one of the other like uh, interesting things that I learned that you sometimes recommend is that you recommend that your patients with sleep apnea that they sleep on their side because then they are less likely to feel the effects of it. And to make sure that they do that, you sometimes ask them to sleep with tennis balls sewn onto the back of their shirt. So they can't possibly sleep on their back even if they want to. So as a doctor, do you find yourself thinking creatively for these kind of uh, Jugar solutions that come from common sense? thinking do you kind of do this a lot or uh, and how do patients react to it so the the next level of jugad by the way for the same solution is to wear a bra in, in the opposite direction and stuff it uh -huh. with tennis balls 
right okay i mean but you don't want to open the door to the pizza delivery guy of course when that happens but but <laughs> but that's a jugaad again you know i mean that's an easier jugaad rather than sewing sometimes but you know people obviously you know stare at you when you say things like that wondering if something's wrong with you but trust me i mean it does work very well because sleep apnea is clearly worse when you're on your back versus when you're on your belly or you know your sides that's the same solution in indirectly we're trying to apply for covid as well right making people sleep prone because the airway opens up the lung opens up a bit and it it, it improves oxygenation a lot of medical grade equipment often is very expensive and uh, and you know all of us do try to work with some sorts of solutions sometimes to help people deal with their lack of ability to sometimes purchase that kind of medical uh, equipment but to do it in a way that that gives them the same relief and and you know i think i think there's a lot of innovation happening in these kinds of spaces as well which suggests that it doesn't have to be that expensive you know sometimes things which are which are not expensive also work well for example in asthma we use inhalers right so inhalers uh, the traditional inhalers which you press and you take a breath have to be coordinated perfectly so the second you press the inhaler if you don't breathe you end up getting a mouth spray nothing goes into the chest right so the solution to that is something called a spacer it's like this round plastic transparent box at the end of which you attach the inhaler you press it so the drug is locked into the space and then you breathe at your own convenience now the jugaad for this which i've seen people do is is use a pet bottle you cut the end of the pet bottle so you you stick the inhaler to that end you keep the mouth of the bottle in your mouth you press the inhaler and you breathe through it and again it takes away the problem of coordination it's a total jugaad in that sense and and from what little i know it 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 seems to work really well as opposed to a spacer which is a more expensive device that sounds really fascinating let's go on to uh, you know one of the other uh, subjects in, in which you've been active which is you've spoken of your smoking cessation therapy and recently in fact you uh, tweeted quote most individuals who consume tobacco know it is harmful but continue to do so because of the highly addictive nature of nicotine what we need to do is not offer such individuals a sermon but a science based way to overcome the addiction stop quote and of course part of the reason that you're into that you care about smoking is you're into all these pulmonary diseases of the lungs which are caused by smoking so it is a big deal you don't just want to treat symptoms you want to get to the root cause make people stop smoking tell me a little bit about this like what are the approaches that you make because most of the approaches towards to make people stop smoking is sort of to guilt them into stopping what do you guys do right so i'm just going to throw some statistics so there was a study called uh the global adult tobacco survey it's called the gats survey uh, when it was done in india it was found that more than 90% of individuals even in rural india even with literacy levels being being questionable more than 90% of individuals knew that tobacco was bad for them you know in the survey around 50% of individuals admitted to having tried to quit in the in the year prior in the previous year this clearly suggests that there is not a knowledge problem so whenever you want to change behavior there are three things that are generally needed for for changing behavior from what again what i understand of behavioral sciences you need the knowledge or uh, you need the motivation and you need the confidence right the problem is as doctors when we see patients sitting in front of us who admit to smoking we think it's a knowledge problem for some reason and we give them a sermon about you know listen this is bad this can affect you in this way it can affect you in that way when the data clearly suggests that they already know that so you're working on the wrong part of the problem the second is the motivation and third is the confidence and if you speak to people who smoke their confidence levels are abysmally low because they've tried many times in the past and they've failed you know most individuals will will not even admit to trying they will not even admit to their own spouses and their own loved ones that they are trying they will do it quietly because their confidence levels are so low that they already know it's not going to work when they start right now the reason for that is that nicotine is a highly addictive substance nicotine addiction is an addiction it's not a habit it's not so we use these words like habit lifestyle choice we use all sorts of words to make the burden of guilt like you said you know to make the person feel guilty to make the person feel responsible for where they're at where the science clearly shows you that it's an addiction and should be treated like any other addiction so when when you see a person who is in front of you and i run a tobacco cessation clinic so they come to me reasonably motivated already which is great you know so i don't have to work on that motivation now that may be a different story altogether how you work on that motivation but but once they are motivated enough they do not need that lecture or that sermon or that guilt trip or that you know the 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 guilting what they need is a solution and the solutions are science based so all over the world the standard 
therapy for smoking cessation has been defined. There are drugs which are designed to work on centers of the brain to give you the same pleasurable experience that a cigarette gives you, whilst at the same time not giving you the thousand other things that a cigarette gives you. And most of these therapies have been used for about three to six months. So it's a it's a defined fixed therapy for three to six months, which a person adheres to according to a certain plan. That plan ensures that they don't get irritable, they don't feel cravings, they don't feel terrible. So, so the bottom line of a smoking cessation clinic is that you are able to quit comfortably. Anybody can quit, right? But that quitting is so uncomfortable usually that people get back thinking that it's easier to continue rather than going down that path. And if you look at the statistics there, of 100 people who decide to quit, within a month, 97 have started smoking again. Only three succeed. And if I had to guess, those three would be individuals who are doing it after, say, a bypass surgery, after a major life event, after getting diagnosed with something that really shakes them up. And that's not where we want people to be. We want people to be able to do it comfortably, and there's a science to it. Now, again, you know, it's it's unfortunate that we have specialized clinics and I have to do it like I have some secret mantra to it. Whereas all over the world, it's general practitioners. It's being done as part of routine healthcare. There is no great skill to this. And what I've been trying really hard in terms of training sessions, we've been working with, with people as well, is to de-specialize this. You know, this is something that your general practitioner should be able to offer you without any judgment, without any gyan. You smoke and you want to give up smoking. This is what you need to do. And it should be as straightforward as that. And this is, again, you know, this is something that's been done all over the world. This is not something special. And, and what do these medicines do? Like, do they tackle the dopamine receptors of the brain or something? Or uh, how, how do they kind of work? So the most uh, fascinating molecule in this group, which has shown the maximum amount of success, is a drug called varenicline. So basically what happens is when you smoke a cigarette or you consume tobacco in any form, the nicotine goes and binds to a receptor in the brain, which eventually leads to the release of dopamine. Now, dopamine is a pleasure chemical, you know, it, 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 and it's a, it's not only is it a pleasure chemical, it comes out in response to some very primal needs. So, you know, hunger, thirst, sex, these are the times when dopamine gets released in the brain. So it has a very strong pleasurable element as well as a very strong primal uh, evolutionary role in human beings. Nicotine binds to these receptors and causes that dopamine surge. So when an individual smokes, he gets that surge of dopamine, which keeps him stimulated in, in some ways, which feeds into that pleasure activity. Now, varenicline goes and binds to the receptor called the acetylcholine receptor, which eventually causes the release of dopamine. So it gives you that kick which you would normally get, and it gives it to you in a sustained way. So a person who smokes or consumes tobacco really craves it when the nicotine levels hit a nadir, hit, hit a really low level. By virtue of this drug constantly stimulating that center, you do not reach those low levels and therefore the, the cravings don't generally occur. What's fascinating is also that if while you're on the drug, you decide to smoke, uh, the, the nicotine in your cigarette smoke uh, does not have any receptor to bind to because the receptor has been blocked by the drug. So you don't experience the pleasure that you would normally get. So I've had a lot of patients come back to me and say, I did smoke, but, you know, I stopped at half a cigarette and I just threw it away because it wasn't doing it for me. So this is what we call a partial agonist antagonist, you know, so it's, it not only stimulates, but it also blocks the receptor. I think, I think the, the physiology, again, is fascinating. Uh, this is one of the drugs that we use. You can also use combination nicotine replacement therapy. So uh, a patch, which generally tends to work for 24 hours in the background, again, preventing those low levels of nicotine combined with either a gum or a lozenge or an inhaler to be used as and when you have cravings. So that's another strategy we employ. And sometimes we use a, a combination of both strategies. But again, this is not based on a gut feeling. So there are certain predictors of addiction. You know, So supposing you've started smoking in your teens, supposing you smoke within the first five minutes of waking up, if you smoke more than 10 to 15 cigarettes a day, you are likely to be more addicted and you, you, you very often need a combination of drugs in that situation. Yeah, this is incredibly fascinating. And of course, it's a smoking specific uh, solution because the molecule would bind to the receptor that nicotine binds to. Uh, and uh, so, you know, it wouldn't be useful for other kinds of addiction. There's an amusing story I have. It's not amusing, it's kind of sad about how I tried to uh, wean a friend of gambling addiction because the mechanisms are the same, right? You're pushing chips forward, dopamine rush in your head and all that. So there's, there's this guy who was a banker who lived in Verli. And uh, the, the location is uh, relevant. So he was a banker. He lived in Worli. He used 
used to play these underground cash games with me back in the day and it was clearly he was just addicted he wasn't using his brain he was just losing big and i liked him a lot i had a very sweet guy and i could realize that bit by bit he's blowing his savings up his wife is pissed off so i called him home one day and i live in andheri and this is also relevant and uh, at the time i called him you know he was playing at this video game parlor in um, uh, bandra so even when you know there were no live games he would go to this video game parlor and play video poker there so anyway so he came home and we chatted about it and as you said the knowledge wasn't a problem he understood it was an addiction i went took him through the biochemistry and all of that and i said we have to figure out some drastic ways of stopping it this is what i recommend that you call your wife right now and you tell her that you are giving her the credit card and all access to the bank and everything and you're just stopping all your access to money she has to give you pocket money every day for whatever taxi or uber you take and that is it you have no other access to your money and he agreed he called his wife she was delighted at the suggestion and i think she also told him mai tumhare liye chicken banati hu aaj come for dinner so he was very excited he said amit you you know you might just have saved my family life and all that and then he leaves home but the problem is this and this is why the locations are important that to get from andheri to worli you have to cross bandra and 3 hours later another friend calls me and he says that bro your friend he is sitting at this video parlor playing for the last two hours so that didn't kind of work out well and i guess uh, you know is there any kind of pharmacology for for general addiction because so many people are also addicted to social media you know or even something like tetris or whatever so uh, the, you know but i guess there's nothing you can do for that in terms of medicine yet right in the in the domain of psychology uh, i know that cognitive behavior therapy is being tried in a lot of addictions hypnotherapy claims to have some success but you know again these things are not very consistent so you you you're not really sure in terms of the literature uh that's one of the problems of um, of sciences that are not pharmacotherapy based right so the drug the dosage mode of delivery when a clinical trial is conducted all these are very clearly defined so therefore all over the world anyone can try to replicate that the problem with behavioral sciences sometimes is that it's the person who whose expertise it is it's the way they deliver it and and to translate that sometimes is a little challenging So let's talk about COVID nineteen now because COVID nineteen is clearly an incredibly difficult problem for a doctor to deal with because you are having every day to make decisions on matters that involve life and death, and in terms of information, you are in the fog of war. You don't know what the hell is going on. You know, someone like you would be looking at the latest research, trying to figure out what is a virus, what does it do. But even there, how does one treat COVID? You don't. So tell me a little bit about your experience over these last few months. That how did your thinking on this evolve? What were the dilemmas you faced? Just what was it like for you guys? I think the worst part was clearly the first two three months, right? Because there was complete uncertainty. We had no idea what was going to work. We started using steroids. about a month or two before the recovery trial got published and we used it in these prolonged fevers that were happening in the second week sometimes with the oxygen levels were dropping we used it purely based on a gut feeling at that point of time and a little bit of literature that was coming up from small reports from china saying that you know methylprednisolone was used in a couple of studies and and we saw we saw positive results and that reinforced our belief in the the appropriate use of steroids at that point but again you know i mean it was one center doing something by themselves based on what you could call trial and error to a certain extent as time passed by and the literature started accumulating and that's you know you have to give immense amount of credit to people who got drug trials and and these these adaptive trials up and running within a few months you know being a researcher myself i know how extremely difficult it is to do simple small little studies and these guys you know like the the solidarity like recovery they did trials on a nationwide scale with multiple centers got everybody on board got randomization to occur protocols you know submitted to ethics committees to do all of that in the in the time span that they did it is is nothing short of a miracle you know and, and that needs to be lauded which also possibly reflects how prepared they were for something like this you know the systems were in place to to roll out a study if need be possibly they had thought about this in advance may not be in the context of a pandemic but in the context of any study for that matter that if they wanted to roll out a study within 2 months they could do it and and do it really well of a high caliber as the results of these studies started coming in it, it became a lot easier in terms of what we definitely know and what we definitely do not know so there's still uncertainty for example you know the use of blood thinners is still an is still an uncertain area A couple of studies published just in the last week. One showed that aspirin possibly doesn't work. One shows that when you use blood thinners in a treatment dose, which we call a therapeutic dose, a high dose doesn't work. 
but this is still evolving so you know there is still uncertainty but as in when the large trials showed us that things definitely don't work i think gradually things started becoming clearer this is one of the places where being you know an epidemiologist kind of possibly helped me because uh, because the cynicism was was the default the, the default was never you know let's try this new thing let's try something else the other thing that was constantly reassuring was that the the number of individuals who got hospitalized the number of individuals who got severe enough was still a small fraction of the total number of cases when that first zero prevalence study came out for example it said 57% of people in slums had already been infected and if you extrapolate it to that you realize that the fraction of individuals who got admitted was a really tiny fraction it wasn't really big if so many people had antibodies already so there were two reassuring things therefore right one was that this was a disease which spared the majority which did not cause a majority to die you know had it been a disease which did cause a majority to die we would have been in in big trouble because then we would have to make constantly make very difficult choices the reason we could go to what is called masterful inactivity or watching you know closely observing monitoring is because we knew at the back of our minds that a majority of individuals are going to do very well without any intervention that was one thing that was that was very useful from a, a from a treatment perspective the second thing that was very useful was the data that kept coming in and telling us what didn't work so you know when plasma got thrown out and you know we realized it didn't work when uh, when drugs like remdesivir there was more accumulating evidence to suggest that it didn't work lopinavir ritonavir there were a lot of hydroxychloroquine all these drugs you know reasonably quickly there was information out there to tell us that we shouldn't be using it so i think the combination of a low severity disease in that sense as an absolute fraction combined with the uh, the rapidity with which evidence was synthesized i think really helped us uh, gain confidence as the pandemic went on you know one of the things that we sometimes talk about in public policy is this flawed mindset of we must do something this is something therefore let's do it and i guess to some extent that is a pressure which would have hit doctors during this period because you would have been under pressure to medicate to give some medicine or the other and therefore even if you are skeptical of say last year one would have been skeptical of hydroxychloroquine and this year you know uh, during the second wave we've had ivermectin remdesivir plasma all lauded as sort of therapies i guess they would one there would be pressure on uh, doctors to prescribe them because relatives would be saying ki nahi nahi ye to you know dad doctor prescribed this for my uncle and so on how does one deal with that because one of the things that i uh, noted was that there was this panic on social media with these hundreds of messages every day or hundreds that i saw every day about ivermectin needed remdesivir needed plasma needed well we know they don't work and the problem is that frantic relatives going out to get them are actually catching covid standing in line somewhere and trying to get the damn medicine there therefore compounding tragedy on tragedy as it were so as a doctor how did you deal with that did you face that kind of pressure from your patients ki are lekin remdesivir nahi diya it was it was an extremely difficult period and uh, and to a certain extent it still is it's just that when you when you gain a voice that is that has a little more credibility and respect with time people tend to trust you a little more but you know it was extremely difficult at the start to tell people that observation to to say that monitoring and you know to, to constantly hand hold them and say that we are monitoring you we are not saying don't do anything and just you know leave it to god we are not saying that we are, we are saying that we are monitoring you steroids came on very early as life saving drugs so we said that we knew that if you do deteriorate we have something that might work tocilizumab at some point of time there was evidence to suggest that it works so we did have drugs for when people deteriorated but to tell people to just stay put was extremely challenging and not just challenging it was it was challenging it was time consuming it was fatiguing as a doctor to have the same conversation over and over and over again and it would give me nightmares at some point of time you know because i am the guy who is telling somebody that you don't do anything knowing fully well that there you know a fraction of the don't do anything is going to deteriorate the unfortunate part is that i have no control over that deterioration i don't have a drug that can prevent that deterioration i don't have the drug that can make the person better today so that deterioration doesn't happen so i am telling a person that i offer you nothing today knowing fully well that you know a small fraction of these individuals who got nothing would deteriorate and then in hindsight would clearly blame me as being the person responsible for their deterioration not understanding that that deterioration unfortunately would have happened no matter what you know 
So that was very scary to to sleep at night knowing that there was a cohort of patients out there who you were hand holding, not giving anything, and knowing that you know when you wake up in the morning there would be a WhatsApp message once in a way saying that you know this person's oxygen levels fell the previous night, got admitted, and you hope to, you know you hope that their faith in you was strong enough that they realized that you did nothing wrong. You know you were following the science. and you know fortunately i think a lot of my patients got it but but it takes it takes a lot of time in terms of counseling and hand holding as well that's what i resent to a small extent that you know i was the one having to explain why i was doing the scientific thing while the guy next door who was prescribing 10 drugs had no explaining to do he said oh you come in you you got covid take these 10 drugs go patient happy doctor happy you know life moves on Nine out of ten of his patients also got better because that's the nature of the illness. One out of ten who didn't get better would probably say, "You know, but my poor doctor tried everything, and still I didn't get better." While I was unfortunately the bad guy, and you know, that that was one thing that I that I didn't really like in terms of having to explain being scientific. I don't think that's how how medicine works. You know, the burden of proof should be on the drug. The drug has to prove its worth. I don't have to prove the fact that my scientific choices of not giving you a drug because there is no drug that works uh, need to be justified on a on an ongoing basis yeah and i can totally see why any doctor would be incentivized to give that cocktail of drugs just to avoid the blame because that is what the patients expect and that's kind of tragic so tell me a quick digression before we come back to covid uh, how does one deal psychologically with patients taking a turn for the worse and dying over the years over so much medical practice especially for a doctor like you pointed out where you've been trained to when you try to look at each uh, patient as uh, not a collection of statistics of age weight whatever but also as a human being you know their names you kind of you're chatting with them about their lives and and then at some point they go and some of the time you can't do anything about it some of the time you can in hindsight know that had i done something different it would have worked out differently so how did you deal with the uh, uh that kind of a process is it still hard after all these years or you know does one kind of build a system of mental defense where you know you can just get on with things so i mean the, the probabilistic thinking and the uncertainty kind of is what you use to soothe your conscience when it does happen because you know at the end of the day you have to soothe your conscience in some way otherwise uh, you know you are not going to make peace and you're not going to be and and if it shatters your confidence completely you're not going to be able to offer the best to the next patient you know so i i think the that the probabilistic thinking probably helps in some ways in that situation because i've i've seen doctors swing from one direction to the other also you have one person who beats the odds and something really bad happens and then you become extremely defensive after that sometimes it's because of litigation sometimes it's just because of a conscience which can't make peace with the fact that something like that happened and if it serves to grow great you know which is which is what it's all about you know on a daily basis all of us are growing i i would be stupid to say that you know i've done everything right all of us have made judgment errors all of us have uh, you know sometimes relied on our instinct when our instincts have failed us and as long as we learn from them in a way that's not hugely detrimental you know so let me give you an example if when we give drugs for tuberculosis if you give it in a young individual 3 out of 1000 individuals the drugs will affect the liver now if that makes me start doing liver function tests on all the thousand to prevent that to pick up those three early firstly there's no there's no reason to believe that i would be able to pick up pick them up early but you know because symptoms manifest when the liver doesn't work function properly and maybe the symptoms come before you can pick it up early but if i you know have one patient out of a thousand get a bad liver and get get a bad hep- episode of hepatitis get admitted for example and it it completely shakes up my belief system and then i start doing liver function tests on every single patient who comes i don't think that's fair as well you know i mean it's 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 okay to feel that something bad should not have happened but you also know that that was within the probability that's been described the world over you need to accept that that's what happened maybe your education skills need to get better maybe you sh- maybe the patient came in too late maybe the patient could have come a day before when they started noticing symptoms rather than wait so it's great to audit what went wrong it's great to look back and try and figure out what went wrong and how can we improve on things but that balance of not therefore you know doing a u turn and completely going the other way in terms of being overly being gung ho about investigations being very very defensive 
I think that's that's a challenging balance. That being said, I mean it's it's it it always shatters you when when you lose someone unexpectedly, and that's the uncertainty that medicine is all about. You know, there are there are some individuals who you will lose on your watch with zero expectations of you losing them. Those tend to be rare events, but when they do happen, you have no clue in terms of you know was that going to happen anyways? Did it happen because of something that I did? Could I have done something better? Was I not serious enough in terms of you know investigating a little more, pushing a little harder? Did the message not come out clearly? And that introspection is is unfortunately part of the deal, you know. And and you know, fortunately, shockers of events which completely fall outside the probability of what you think are rare. You know, fortunately, they are rare. But when they do happen, and and you know, that's the 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 busier you get, the the larger your base of patients. Such events do happen with an increasing frequency. So, what what would happen once in two years maybe starts happening once in six months, but you definitely lose sleep when that happens. You, you, you it, it shatters you. It completely disturbs you for a few days, and and you never forget that. So that you will never forget when you talk about you know your past experiences. You will never forget uh, a person who who behaved in a way that you completely didn't expect. And you mentioned litigation a couple of times. Like, is that something that's an issue in India that you have to worry about litigation? Are you, in probabilistic terms, how likely are are you to get sued? And uh, you know, also just in general to deal with uh, relatives of patients when things don't go right. Like we've heard of stories of shocking stories of doctors and nurses being beaten up uh, when um, uh, recently when patients have died of COVID nineteen. But uh, in general, how big is the litigation issue and and just dealing with uh, rel- relatives of patients? it is a big issue not in terms of uh, you know the the volume of cases that that get registered but it's a big issue in terms of even if one case gets registered uh, the way the system is designed is that uh, you know you're almost guilty and unless you prove your innocence and and that's 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 very challenging so most of us have gone through it once a couple of years or so and when we do go through it, it it's extremely biased against us is what most of us tend to agree on so let me give you an example so in the in the city of mumbai for example if if somebody wants to file a case they can simultaneously file it in three different forums there's the consumer forum there's law and there's the medical council so you can simultaneously file the same case in all three and the doctor has to make appearances in all three simultaneously you know and it's not that the decision in one can influence the decision in the other you can get three separate decisions so once you go through something like this it it does make you uh, a little defensive for sure it it does change the way in which you uh, in which you naturally treat patients and um, you know i do understand that patient rights have to be protected at all costs i do understand that you know doctors make make mistakes and have to pay for it when they do make mistakes in some form that's the only natural way to do things you know we all have indemnity insurance to accept the fact that we will make mistakes you know no matter what and and therefore the compensation needs to be covered by indemnity but as long as the process is fair i think good will come out of it as long as the process is skewed to such an extent that doctors start second guessing every move that they make it's 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 going to go in the us way where everything is so defensive that the system will get expensive it's the example i gave i just gave you right so if i want to make sure that nobody gets hepatitis i'm going to just make 1000 people do lfts to kind of say that you know i covered my uh, grounds i covered my bases i did what i had to do despite that this happened okay you know i can't help it and and do it just from that perspective do it not because it's going to help my patient do it not because i genuinely believe it makes a difference but do it only because on paper i have done it you know and that's that's protected me so i really hope it doesn't go that way but unfortunately you know there are indicators that it might be going that way let's get back to covid and you know one of the very valid points that you made and and which i kind of want to underscore is that if someone is using medicine the burden of proof is on that person that you got to show that the medicine works and the reason uh, you know that deserves underscoring is that it's not that if a medicine doesn't work it doesn't work it, uh, medicines have tons of side effects like uh, you know in the case of steroids uh, as we now know and as uh, from what i recall you were earlier than others in pointing out vociferously that there's no point in giving steroids in the first week of infection and all because people will get a fever and then they'll fight the fever and then they'll get better most of the time when they don't get better when they deteriorate when there are oxygen issues 
that's where steroids like dexamethasone and all can be useful the problem with giving steroids early on is that it will actually work in getting the fever down but it will also get the immune system down so covid will actually hurt you more and it's in the second week where you could just completely collapse and it's literally because of the medicine that was uh, given to you so now what i'd like you to do for our listeners is take them through how you look at this whole treatment cycle of covid what is recommended what is not like at a bare bones level i know that in the first week if you just have fever you got to monitor your oxygen and you got to take paracetamol and that's it right so just kind of go through that kind of protocol for people who might be listening in and especially people who are not in big cities who don't have access to doctors and all of that uh, how should they approach it what should they do uh, you know because people tend to panic you know you'll have an epidemic of sighing all over again so i think the reassuring thing that all your all the listeners need to know is that we still believe that a majority of individuals get better with nothing right if you look at the recent study in fact from the us which was the antibody cocktail study uh, they found an, a hospitalization rate in high risk individuals so individuals who had at least one risk factor in the placebo arm of that study it was about 3% of them who got hospitalized so it's not even the traditional 15% that we talk about it's possibly a lot lower if you include the zero prevalence studies in india as well i'm sure the figure that we'll arrive at would be somewhere around 3% of hospitalization so 97 out of 100 individuals will get better at home without anything being done and i think that's very reassuring now what happens is the typical cycle of covid is that the first week is where the virus enters the body the first week is where the virus multiplies for some time the first week is where the body launches an immune response against the virus and that immune response just by virtue of the fact that 97% people probably get better suggests that that immune response does its job in most of the cases somehow antibodies are generated they neutralize the virus you could feel fatigued you could feel tired you could feel low energy for some time but by and large your life will move on by and large you will return to baseline in a month or so now in that first week what are the things that have been shown to work one of the things that has been that may have a role is an inhaler an inhaler of steroids but steroids at a very low dose inhaled directly into the lungs in some way modulates the inflammation you know helps in some way uh, and there are a couple of small studies which have shown that it may work again the caveat is that these are small studies maybe down the road that we may realize that they aren't necessarily wonder drugs or great drugs maybe it's a small role that being said inhalers are extremely safe right so the safety profile of inhalers has been established for a long long time now at the doses that's being recommended for covid for a short period again we don't anticipate any major side effects so the inhalers work in the first week uh, especially if you have a cough especially if you have lower respiratory symptoms the other thing that works in the first week is the antibody cocktail so the antibody cocktail is basically preformed antibody so normally what your body would do generate an immune response that 1 to 2 or 1 to 3% of individuals in whom that immune response doesn't work for some reason they might benefit with boosting their immune response with an antibody cocktail injected into them now this works when given within the first 7 days of of symptoms so it has to be given early it is recommended in individuals who have risk factors so it's not recommended in individuals who otherwise also are likely to do well so if you have heart disease if you are elderly if you have underlying kidney disease if you are immunosuppressed in some ways if you are obese if you have diabetes you know these are the risk factors in whom you could consider the antibody cocktail of course it's very expensive it costs about 60000 rupees for a dose but it may have a role so that's what works in the first week now by the end of the first week majority of individuals would have recovered the fever would have settled the cough would start getting a little better their their oxygen levels would be rock solid throughout they would never have dropped and these are individuals who don't need to do anything at this point you know if the cough has settled they stop the inhaler as well in this small fraction a small proportion of individuals at the end of the second week what happens is a hyper immune response so the body's immunity has kicked in but it's over zealous for some reason it's over enthusiastic it does too much and that hyper immune response causes the oxygen levels to go low that causes a person to get breathless the cough to get worse this is the stage at which problems occur this is the stage at which individuals often get hospitalized if your oxygen levels are low this is where the steroids work so the oxygen levels low mean that your lung is full of immune immune cells they could be white blood cells they could be antibodies this whole cytokine storm that we talk about the lots of immune cells which are trying to fix the lung but are actually doing harm and they are suppressed with the use of corticosteroids so steroids suppress your immunity at at this point where the immune response is is too much 
If you do the same in the first week when your body's natural immune response is trying to fight it, those same steroids will suppress that natural immune response and leave you completely exposed to the virus, right? So the virus has a, an unopposed position where it can multiply. There's no natural immunity. The steroids have suppressed that. Sugars also go up with steroids. So it's a great environment for the virus to proliferate. At the end of the first week, very often there's no virus left in the body or there's minuscule virus. So therefore, it's safe to use steroids. You suppress the immune response. Now, if you deteriorate further, so if despite giving you steroids for about one to two days, there are certain markers which also help if your CRP is above 75, you might be a candidate for a drug like tocilizumab because that's a drug which supplements the use of steroids. It tries to suppress your immunity even further. Some studies are also looking at higher doses of steroids. So the doses of steroids which are currently recommended are 6 milligrams of dexamethasone once a day. But there are some studies which suggest that if, if despite the dexa you're deteriorating, 12 milligrams could be attempted. You can double the dose of steroids, especially if you don't have access to tocilizumab or, you know, again, it's a very expensive drug. Oxygen is life-saving. If your oxygen levels are low at this stage, you know, being on oxygen helps. Sleeping prone really helps because it helps improve oxygenation. Being on either a non-invasive ventilator or high-flow nasal devices also help in, you know, helping your lungs recover, giving you adequate oxygen while your lungs are on, on the pathway to recovery. And if things still don't recover at this point, then you get onto ventilation, then you get onto uh, whatever salvage modalities are, are feasible. So that's fascinating. And the picture emerging here is that a lot of these people, it's not the virus that is killing them directly. The virus is setting off an immune response, which is more or less eliminating the virus by the end of the first week or reducing it substantially. And then the cytokine storm really kicks in or other, you know, the overactivity of the immune system is what really gets you. And it's a downward spiral from there, unless all of these treatments come in. And of, of course, when you have oxygen shortages, then it's basically the system killing you because otherwise those people wouldn't have died all incredibly uh, fascinating so you know i've uh, we are almost at the end of the time that you had allotted me and of all my guests i would feel incredibly uh, guilty about taking too much more of your time so just a couple of questions the one on covid and then one back to medicine in general and the covid question is that you guys um, have just managed to get the official guidelines of the government actually changed to reflect what you feel the treatment uh, protocol should be which was earlier not the case earlier the case was science would find something and then the you know the bureaucracy would catch up later the treatment protocols would catch up later but now hearteningly one is finding that even the official guidelines are along these lines right don't do over treatment don't use all these random plasma ivermectin and all that which don't work but instead the, the, this is a protocol to follow which is kind of exactly what you laid out so how easy or hard is it to sort of work with uh, these kind of authorities where bureaucracy is an issue where again the cover my ass incentive may get in the way where they might be wary of you know not recommending something what if something happens you know why not just put all the medicines out there so how, what is that process like of dealing with government of dealing with uh, authorities uh, uh, like that because in some capacities even you have given at least informal advice right right so i cannot take any credit for the change in the guidelines uh, unfortunately we don't know who the authors were also because you know i think I, all of us want to pat their backs and all of us want to say thank you, but we don't really know as of now who to thank. But, you know, that being said, it's a great move forward. Uh, the process, I, I wouldn't know what was the process which actually led to the final change in policy. But I think all of us, uh, you know, in whatever capacity possible, have been trying to push people towards rational cures. I think some of it also is a consequence of bad outcomes happening. So I think the mucormycosis pandemic sensitized a lot of people to the fact that steroids were being possibly used for prolonged periods of time, possibly being used inappropriately. And that was an eye-opener. So I think it took a second pandemic of the mucormycosis to realize the inappropriateness of, of steroids. Now, now that's that, it's unfortunate that that's how it happened. But, you know, in this case, I think that was a nudge towards shifting to evidence-based uh, medicine as well. I think the, the rushes for remdesivir, the black marketeering that people saw for remdesivir, also was a nudge in the right direction in terms of people realizing that it wasn't just a science problem. The science problem led to actual bigger problems in terms of this belief that it was life-saving, this exploitation of individuals who were at their at their most vulnerable. And I and I think that was an that was an eye-opener as well. Plasma, I think, you know, it was, you know, finally after saying it over and over again in different forums, I think different, you know, it plasma was actually unfortunate also because India, that was one 
great trial which came out of india right in the midst of this pandemic we still managed to do one good trial which is placid which was related to plasma we proved that it didn't work and we still didn't take it off our guidelines so that was unfortunate in a way but i think people pointed it out over and over again you know after recovery published their data from placid i think i think that changed as well it's not been easy but i i think there's this there's there's a network of individuals who have the ability to influence the the right people the people on committees the people on guideline committees the people in 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 positions of creating those guidelines and i and i think you know the gradual soft influence that everyone had around possibly nudged them in the right direction so i wouldn't know the exact process in which it changed but i i think it's a great great move that it changed and let's hope that that whatever thought processes uh, um, opened up these doors would still stay in place for future updating of the evidence you know so fantastic last point that you don't just want it to be this one off where they did the right thing and you know whatever but you want those processes to remain so it is always science based and evidence based and by the way you know in an earlier episode i mentioned about remdesivir being slightly dubious and uh, one doctor actually wrote in to me i don't remember if he wrote to me or he put a twitter comment but he basically said that why are you spreading wrong information i have used it on my patients it works to which i you know if someone like that is listening to this i would just say go back to the start of the episode and listen to what we said about regression to the mean and also one should not quickly uh, you know ascribe causation maybe it is something some other medicine that actually helped so we never know counterfactuals there so my final question is this and it's a broad question about medicine in general which is so when we look back to the 19th century we know the state of medicine was so dismal and uh, we think of today and we say oh we have advanced so much but it is another fallacy that humans tend to commit they think that where they are now is a peak of human progress and the truth is that a hundred years later when we look at the state of medicine today we are going to say oh my god what primitive people what are they even doing right and it strikes me that we are at an exciting time perhaps even an inflection point for medicine and i'm sorry if this is naive please correct me but i say this completely as an outsider but just looking at for example what our understanding of genetics and the genome the insights that we've gotten from that or what artificial intelligence is doing eric topol has a great book deep medicine about that it, it strikes me that there's a lot to be excited about the future now you are of course on the cutting edge of all of this in terms of reading up on it and understanding it and all of that so looking ahead what is the future of medicine like what do you think 20 years later you will be doing differently what are the ways in which your life will be better i mean some people speak about an mrna vaccine for cancer and all that that would be really nice please bring it on and hopefully sleeping enough will pre- prevent alzheimers for uh, those of us who sleep enough but apart from these uh, frivolous asides how different will the future of medicine actually look and another context in which i kind of bring that up is that in india most people don't have the privilege to go to a doctor the vast majority of india is completely underserved or served by quacks and the vast majority of doctors also will not know treatment protocol for basic things as i discussed in my episode with kartik mulli dharan so actually what most indians do is that they just get by in one jugadu way or the other for minor things and it is only when something major happens that they actually land up at a hospital and all of that so that is their medicine is there hope for them is there hope for say ai and all of that to help empower them with information and knowledge and you know those kind of resources so some of the changes uh, are you know just to allude to what we've already spoken about so something like sleep apnea for example right so if you see 20 years ago so that's uh, you know roughly within this you know i was i was in mbbs 20 years ago uh, the machine used to be about 10 kilos in terms of weight it used to be really bulky really uncomfortable masks that people couldn't wear almost everybody was scribbling and complaining Uh, you look at where we are today right it's it's a 400 gram machine which is now currently available you get a download which clearly tells you you know what was what? the level of obstruction before what it is today there is feedback in terms of whether there's a leak whether you want to change those settings how you want to manage things so just in terms of you know the sheer information that's currently available to us to tweak things to improve comfort to improve patient adherence uh, all this is, has improved within a span of like less than 20 years or so so tuberculosis for example another disease where once upon a time you know when when the mdr epidemic or the multi drug resistant tb epidemic began we would do cultures the cultures would take about 6 to 8 weeks to grow then we would do drug susceptibility tests which would tell us what is sensitive what is not sensitive now we have cartridge based tests with which within one and a half hour tell us whether you have mdr tb or not 
So, so yeah. there's been a lot of progress which we've already experienced in in the past 15 to 20 years. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the point that you make is very valid. So, progress yeah. at, at the cutting edge does not necessarily percolate down to progress for the vast majority. Um, however, I mean, something like telemedicine, for example, has the potential of reaching people in, in remoter areas. I think okay. COVID has normalized telemedicine to a certain extent. Mm. So I work with IIT and we've created this digital stethoscope, for example, which when given to a primary healthcare center, the person can apply it to a person's chest and I can listen to the sounds via Bluetooth, via an app somewhere else in the country. So I can literally auscultate a patient, a patient I'm not seeing. These are potential things that that can make a difference. But, uh, you know, it's not only technology, it's also the human skill that needs to develop. If we've realized, you know, you can give people thousands of ventilators, but, you know, even at an institute like mine, it takes a certain level of skill to use a ventilator. And I cannot claim to have complete expertise. I, I probably have 50% expertise, you know, because I'm not an intensivist. It's the intensivist at my hospital who really knows how to handle a, a ventilator. So to assume that somebody who is not even at a tertiary care institute in a smaller center would just be given a ventilator and the person would be able to handle the ventilator uh, is, is not necessarily true. So I, I think the, the in improvements in terms of technology has to go in parallel with the improvements in terms of human expertise as well to use those measures. You know, when you talk about molecular genetics, when you talk about so, phenotyping individuals, so for sleep apnea, there is a potential of a new drug which can cure sleep apnea in, in a certain subset of individuals. So, you know, even a CPAP might look bulky, even the current CPAP might look bulky and redundant 20 years from now if we have a pill that's going to fix it, right? But that level of what we call individualized medicine, personalized medicine, that level of phenotyping to try and figure out who fits into which uh, basket is going to be expensive. Uh, it's going to be difficult to interpret, difficult to manage. So if we struggle with letting evidence-based medicine for a disease that has basically five drugs or six drugs, if we struggle with that percolating, imagine, imagine trying to communicate the sophistication that you get from a whole genome output and, and trying to explain the nuances to, to anybody. Mm -hmm. I'm not looking down on somebody or I'm not, I'm not talking about some, you know, me being superior to somebody else. But, you know, we are going to be as illiterate about things like that as anybody else. And to constantly be able to update yourself and, and to then be able to make that reach the lowest uh, rung of society, I think that's going to be a big challenge. Yeah, I mean, these are very wise words in the sense that, you know, I, I am as optimistic as you that science will keep marching on forward, but the state and the society also have to keep up and advance similarly. And what I would also point out is that many of these treatments that will come up from understanding the genome better or using the insights of AI are something that privileged people like us can access really easily. But that is not the core problem. The core problem is something else. And the core problem is just getting it out there. And especially in India with the state of both our state and our society, it's worrying, but hopefully science will empower us and uh, we'll get the job done. Lance, I'm so privileged and lucky to have three hours of your time of all people to talk to. So thanks so much for sharing uh, your insights and more power to you for all the amazing work you do. Thank you, Amit. Thank you for uh, having me over. I, I, I know this is a great podcast and all of my friends and family are very, are very excited for me being a part of this. So thank you for giving me a platform. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much. If you enjoyed listening to this episode, check out the show notes, dive into rabbit holes, a lot of fascinating stuff in there. You can follow Lance on Twitter at Lancelot underscore Pinto. You can follow me at Amit Varma, A-M-I-T-V-A-R-M-A. -A. You can browse past episodes of The Scene and the Unseen at sceneunseen.in. Thank you for listening and hey, take care of yourself. Did you enjoy this episode of The Scene and the Unseen? If so, would you like to support the production of the show? You can go over to sceneunseen.in slash support and contribute any amount you like to keep this podcast alive and kicking. Thank you. <laughs>